Section 1 of The Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe by Longus Translated by George Moore This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anamika Proemial Whilst hunting in the island of Lesbos, I saw in a grave consecrated to the nymphs the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life, a painted carving figuring a human love story in all its joys and tribulations. The grove itself was beautiful. Flowers were not lacking, nor comely trees, and a rill issuing from the rocks brought a sweet refreshment to the trees and flowers. But the painted carving was more pleasing, and it was of such voluptuous subject and so marvelously wrought that many, even strangers, journeyed thither to supplicate the nymphs and to admire the sculpture. Women in labor were seen in it, women adjusting the swaddles of their babes, babes cast out in wild places for shepherds to bring home or for beasts to suckle, and there were young lovers united in love, and pirates on the sea, and bands that roamed the country, and many other things all telling of love. These I saw with much pleasure, and all seeming to me beautiful, I was taken with the desire to set the story down in writing, and finding one who could interpret the picture to me, and having heard all, I composed four books, votive offerings to Eros, to the nymphs and to Pan, and to all men, a lovely possession that will help to cure the sick, to comfort the sorrowful, and recall memories of love to those whose time for love is over, and instruct those who have not yet loved. For from Eros there has been no escape in the past, and there never will be any, as long as there be beauty in this world for the eye to see. And may the God grant me such good sense as will enable me to write with wisdom of the passions of others. The Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe Book the First The sea flows round Mytilene, a fair city of Lesbos, and channels filled by the sea and adorned by bridges of polished white stone divide it so frequently that the beholder, viewing it from a distance, would perceive a group of small islands rather than a city. About eight or nine leagues from this city, a rich man had an estate, the finest in the island of Lesbos, containing game coverts, hillsides clothed with vines, wheat-growing fields, pasturage for cattle, and along the shore the sea washed long reaches of fine sand. On this estate, a goat herd named Lamon noticed, whilst watching his flock, that one of his she-goats would disappear suddenly, and seeking for some reason why she should abandon her kid, he kept his eye upon her, till one hot noon he saw her enter a dense thicket, fenced with briars and woven ivy. He pushed his way through these, and on a bed of fine grass, soft as down, a child lay beneath the goat's udder, pressing it with his greedy hands as if it were a mother's breast. To imagine Lamun's surprise is easy. He approached and found that the child was a boy, beautiful, well-shapen, and in rich clothes that did not seem in keeping with the foundling. He was wrapped in a purple mantle, fastened with a golden brooch, and beside him was a small, ivory-handled knife. The goatherd's first thought was to take away these tokens of the child's noble birth, leaving him to his fate. But his second thought awakened a feeling of shame in him, that he should be less human than the she-goat. So when night came, he gathered up the tokens and the child, and, followed by the she-goat, brought them to his wife Myrtale, who, fairly astonished, asked if in these last days she-goats gave birth to little boys. Lamun told his story, how on finding the she-goat suckling the child, he had been tempted to leave him to his fate, but was overtaken with shame at the thought of such cruelty. And she being of the same mind as himself, they were soon agreed that they should rear the boy. They packed away all that belonged to him, saying everywhere that he was their own, and that he might be thought to be of shepherd kin, they called him Daphnis. And after this event, when two years had gone by, 
Laman's luck befell another shepherd of the neighborhood named Dryas. Whither he led his flocks was a cave known as the Cave of the Nymphs, a rock of great bulk, and within it the nymphs were carven in the stone with unsandaled feet, their arms naked to the shoulders, their hair scattered around their throats, girdled above the hips, each with face delighted yet sober, as if they had come together to keep step in some mystic dance. From a fissure in the rock a spring of water issued, spread into a pool or basin in the hollowest part of the cave, and flowing out, kept fresh the swards and lawns of the grove, and passed on through the green meadow beyond. And hung upon the rock all round were milking pails, flutes, and reed pipes, votive offerings of shepherds long passed away. Into this cave one of his ewes wandered so often that more than once he had looked upon her as lost, and his mind, being to impose the rule of the herd upon her, to compel her to graze with the others, he cut a supple branch of osier, and having woven it into a noose, he entered the cave, thinking to lay hold of her amid the rocks. But he was no sooner within the cave than the strange sight met his eyes of the ewe surrendering her milk in human wise to a little child. The pretty, neat mouth of the child, having drunk all that one tit could give, passed on to the next, and the child having drunken enough, the ewe turned her head to lick the babe's face. This time it was a girl, and with her, as with the boy, were laid tokens whereby her kin might be proven, a snood of woven gold, gilt shoes, and socks embroidered with gold. And Dryas, deeming the discovery to be a gift from the gods, and learning pity and love from the sheep, took the child in his arms, put the tokens in his wallet, and prayed to the nymphs that he might happily rear their poor little suppliant. Now when the time came for him to fold his flock, returning to his shealing he told his wife what he had seen, showed her what he had found, saying that she would do nothing but what was right, in accepting this child for her daughter, to rear as if it was her own, without telling anybody how they had come by her. Nape was the name of the shepherdess, and Nape from that moment was the mother of the little girl, and loved her so tenderly that she was often jealous of the ewe that was always by to feed her with her tit. And to make believe that the child was their very own, she too was given a shepherd's name, and was called Chloe. Before many years had gone by, these children were tall, and their beauty seemed out of keeping with the life of clowns. And it was when one was fifteen, and the other two years younger, that Laman and Dryas dreamed in one night the same dream, that the nymphs, those of the cave and the springhead, where Dryas had discovered the little girl, consecrated Daphnis and Chloe to the service of a very proud and lovely boy, who had wings on his shoulders, and carried a bow and little arrows, and that he having touched both of them with the same arrow, ordained that one should lead the goats, and the other the sheep. The vision or dream foretelling the lot of their foster children caused the good shepherds some grief. They would have wished a different fate for them than to be shepherds and goat herds. For till then, their belief was that the marks found on the clothing promised a better fortune, and Daphnis and Chloe were reared more gently than befalls the children of shepherds. Some reading and writing they had, and such notions of truth and honor as prevail among hills and valleys. All the same, their parents inclined to do the will of the gods whose providence had saved these children, and each having communicated his dream to the other, and sacrificed at the cavern to the winged boy, his name was unknown to them, they sent the twain to the fields, instructed in all knowledge needful for shepherds, how the flock should feed before midday and after the heat of the day had gone, at what hour they should be watered, at what hour it led to the fold, when the crook should be used, and when the voice was enough. The children accepted the trust with as much joy as if they had been given some great estate. They loved their she-goats and their ewes more than is common among shepherds, for she felt that she owed her life to a ewe, and he remembered that a she-goat had suckled him. Now it was about the beginning of the springtime, when all the flowers were blowing in the woods and meadows and on the hills. Already had begun the murmuring of bees in the fields, and the bleeding of newborn lambs. The flocks gambled on the hillsides, 
The hawk moths buzzed, darted, dropped their long tongues into the depths of the flowers, and the woods resounded with the song of birds. All that was alive saluted the incoming season, and Daphnis and Chloe, in the ardor of youth, imitated all they heard and saw. For hearing the birds sing, they sang. Seeing the lambs skip, they skipped. And then, like the bees, they sought flowers, passing some into their bosoms, weaving some into reeds for the nymphs. And side by side, doing their work together, they led their different flocks from pasture to pasture, Daphnis running ahead to bring back the ewes that had wandered from the flock, Chloe often restraining the she-goats from high, steep crags. Sometimes one kept watch over the two flocks, whilst the other engaged in some prank, the pranks of shepherds and of children. Scampering forth in the morning, she would gather some rushes to make a cage for a grasshopper, and so wholly bent was she on the weaving that her flock was forgotten. At a little distance, Daphnis cut reeds, and after cleaning away the joints and joining the reeds together with soft wax, he practiced playing the double flute all day till nightfall. At midday, they shared their milk or wine. The food they had brought from home was divided between them, and so it may be said that it was easier to see the ewes dispersed, each straying whither she listed, than Daphnis and Chloe apart. But whilst they played, Eros wrought trouble for them. A wolf, having whelped in the neighborhood, harried the flocks for food for her cubs, and the folk came by night to dig pits six feet deep and twenty wide. The earth flung out of these was scattered far and wide, and the pits were hidden with long, thin rods, so light that a hare could not have passed over them without falling through. Earth and leaves were scattered on the top, so that the place might seem even and undisturbed. Many such pits were digged in the hills and in the plain, but the wolf, suspecting a trap, always turned aside. Goats and ewes, however, met their death in these pits, and Daphnis nearly met his in one of them, when two he-goats, mad with jealousy, charged with such force that in the budding a horn of one was broken, and the unhorned goat, overcome with pain, fled bleeding from the combat, followed by his rival, who would leave him no peace. For the broken horn vexed Daphnis, and angered by the persistence of the victor, he caught up his crook and followed after. And so eager was the goat to escape from blows, and Daphnis to give them, that neither took heed whither he was running. So both fell into the trap, the goat first, Daphnis on the top of him, astride and clutching. Thereby his fall was broken, and at the bottom of the pit, he waited in tears for someone to come and draw him out of it. Chloe, witness of his misadventure from afar, ran to the brink, and seeing that he was still alive, called a neat herd to help her. The neat herd came bustling, seeking about him for a rope, but rope there was none to find, till Chloe caught sight of one that the diggers of the pit had lost among the bushes, ran to it, and gave it to the neat herd, who threw an end of it to Daphnis, and holding the other end, with Chloe's help, he drew Daphnis to the edge of the pit, and they helping, the boy clutching all he could lay hands on, earth and stones, was released finally from the trap. The neat herd then went down into the pit, and the goat was pulled out, but both his horns were broken, the vanquished being soon avenged. And the neat herd took him away in payment for his help, leaving the twain considering the story they would tell when they returned home. If he were missed, they would say the wolf had gotten him. Then returning to their flocks, and finding them grazing peacefully and in good order, they repaired to an oak tree, and looked to see what part of his body Daphnis had wounded in his fall. In no part of his body was there blood, nor bruises. Mud, however, was everywhere, in his hair and upon him, and they took counsel, agreeing that only by washing could the mischance be concealed from Lamon and Myrtale. Wherefore, going with Chloe to the cave of the nymphs, he gave her his scrip and his jacket and his shirt to hold, whilst he washed his hair, black as ebony, thick locks falling about his neck, burnt brown by the sun, almost to the tint of the shadow his hair would cast. Chloe watched him, surprised to find him beautiful, and having never thought him beautiful before, 
she imagined that it was the water in the cave that had conferred beauty upon him. She washed his back and shoulders, and in washing his skin, it seemed so fine and soft that more than once, without his perceiving it, she touched herself, for she was in doubt which of the two bodies was the finer. As it was then late, already the sun was low, they called their beasties to follow, and from that time Chloe had no other thought in her mind but to see Daphnis bathing. When they returned to the fields next day, whilst Daphnis sat under the oak, as was his custom, playing his flute as the she-goats lay about him, seeming to take pleasure in the pretty music, Chloe sat by him, watching her ewes grazing, but more often her eyes were turned from them to Daphnis, and still finding him beautiful, and thinking that his beauty might be derived from the music itself, she took the flute from him and played it, so that she might be as beautiful as he. Then she wished that he would bathe once more, and whilst he bathed, she saw him naked, and was unable to resist touching him, and when they returned in the evening homeward, she thought of Daphnis naked, and this thought was the beginning of her love. Very soon she had no thought and no remembrance of anything except Daphnis, and never spoke of anything but him. What she felt she could not find words to tell, being but a simple girl reared in the fields, and never having heard in her life even the word love. All the same, her soul was oppressed, and very often her eyes filled with tears. Days passed without her taking any food, and nights without her finding sleep. She laughed, and then tears fell. She slept, and a moment after was awake and sitting up in bed, she grew pale, and then her face was aflame. The heifer stung by the fly was never madder than she. She would fall at times into a kind of reverie, and all alone discoursed with herself in this fashion. I am sick, and I do not know what my sickness is. I suffer, and there is no wound. I mourn, yet no sheep is dead. I burn even in the deepest shade. Many briars have scratched me, but I did not weep, nor have I cried when stung by bees. Wherefore it must be that this sickness that fills my heart is greater than all that has gone before. True it is that Daphnis is beautiful, but he is not the only one. His cheeks are red, but flowers are too. He sings, but so do the birds. And yet, when I see the flowers and hear the birds, they do not leave any thought behind. Ah, oh, that I were his flute, that he might take me in his lips. Ah, oh, that I were a little kid, that he might take me in his arms. Oh, wicked fountain that has made him so beautiful, why canst thou not make me beautiful too? Oh, nymphs, you will not let me die, I that was born and lived among you. Who after me will weave you garlands and nosegays? And who will have care for my poor lambs? And my pretty Sakala? that I had such trouble to catch. How purposeless will thy song be in the hot noontide. Thy voice can no longer bring sweet sleep to me under the branches. Daphnis has robbed me of sleep. So did the lassie speak, as she sought in herself for what had befallen her, consumed by a fire yet unable to put a name upon it. But Dorkin, a neat herd, a young youth, on whose chin a hair had just begun to curl, Smitten with Chloe's beauty on the day he had helped her to pull Daphnis out of the pit, was now more than ever enamored of her, his love having increased day by day, blinding him so completely that he was distracted by no fear of coming upon a rival in Daphnis. As a child he looked upon him. All his mind was given to how he might get her. Whether by presence, trickery, or peradventure by force, mattered not, so long as he got her and being learned in the ways of love, his first present was of a choice flute to Daphnis, the pipes being joined together by brass instead of wax, and to the lassie he gave a spotted fawn-skin wherewith to cover her shoulders. And these seeming to him enough to make sure of his friendship with both of them, he paid no further attention to Daphnis, but every day brought something new to Chloe. Sometimes he brought a rich cheese, sometimes ripe fruit, sometimes garlands of flowers, or mayhap birds that he had robbed from their nests. Once he gave her a goblet gilded at the brim, and another time a calf that he had brought from the mountain. And she, 
simple and unsuspicious, ignorant that all these gifts were but love-bait, accepted them willingly and showed much pleasure. But her pleasure was less to receive from him than to give to Daphnis. And one day Daphnis, for it could not be else that he too should know the pains of love, picked a quarrel with Dorkin. The twain contested their beauty before Chloe, the judge, and a kiss from her was the prize to be awarded to the victor. Whereupon Dorkin, the first to speak, said, I am taller than he. My charge is beeves and his but goats, and as beeves are above goats, so is the neat herd above the goat herd. I am white as milk, fair as a sheaf from the harvest field, sweet-smelling as a leaf in springtime. Moreover, I was suckled by my mother and not by a beast. He is little, puny, and beardless as a woman. Black of skin he is, rank as his own he-goats. A goat-herd, a poor white, too needy to keep a dog, said to have been suckled by a she-goat. By my faith, he is as he should be, nourished by a she-goat and the look of a kid upon him. So spoke Dorkin, and Daphnis answered him. Yes, I was suckled by a she-goat, and so was Jupiter. My charge is she-goats, and my flock would show well beside his cows. I am a goat-herd, but with no more taint of the buck upon me than Pan, who, none the less, is more buck than human. I ask no more of life than milk and cheese and hard bread and thin wine, meat and drink of shepherds like ourselves. But since I shared these with Chloe, I have no thought for what the rich eat. I am without beard. So was Bacchus. I am black. So also is the hyacinth. Bacchus is preferable to satyrs, and the hyacinth to a lily. That fellow is red as a fox, white as a town girl, and will be presently hairy as a buck. If thou kiss me, Chloe, thou wilt kiss my mouth. If thy kiss be given to him, thou wilt kiss the hair that reaches to his lips. And it behooves thee to remember that a ewe gave thee her milk, yet thou art beautiful. On this word, Chloe did not allow him to finish his speech, so great was her pleasure in hearing herself praised by him. And having desired a kiss a long while, she sprang to her feet, and without more ado, awarded him the prize, an innocent kiss, without art, but ardent enough to inflame hearts in youthful years. Dorkin, seeing himself outdone, fled into the woods to hide his shame and chagrin from all, and to seek other means whereby he might satisfy his love. And Daphnis was hardly more happy than he, for Chloe's kiss had stung him to the quick. One moment he was sad, and then he fell to sighing. He shuddered, and his heart beat quickly. A look from Chloe paled his face, and then a blush transfused it. His eyes were open. He admired her fair hair, the sweetness of her eyes, and the freshness of her skin, whiter than the creamy milk of her ewes. He did not eat, only tasted his food, and with drink he only wetted his lips. He was pensive and dumb, whereas before he chattered like a cicala, and he who had jumped and gambled with his goats sat apart, still as an image, his flock out of sight, his flute forgotten, his head sunk like a flower on its stalk. He withered and dried like grass in the summertime, and he sat in joyless silence, never speaking except when he spoke to her or of her. Finding himself alone on occasions, he walked chatting to himself. Goddesses, what mischief has Chloe's kiss worked within me? Her lips are tenderer than roses, her mouth sweeter than a honeycomb, and her kiss bitterer than a bee's sting. I have often kissed my kids, and often kissed her newborn lambs, and the little calf that Dorkin gave her, but her kiss was a different kiss. My breath comes in pantings, my heart flutters, my soul languishes, and still I desire to kiss again. O oh, dearly paid for victory, O oh, strange, nameless victory, poisonous! But did she gather poison before she kissed me? How is it then that she is not dead? The swallows cry about me, and my flute is silent. How the kids skip, but I am sitting warily. The fields are in flowery prime, and I tie no posy nor garland. The violets and hyacinths bloom, Daphnis pines and fades, 
for the thought is upon him that Dorkin may have come to seem to her more beautiful than he. Thus sorrowed the gentle Daphnis, and he spoke these words like one who knew the pangs of love for the first time. But the swain Dorkin, the neat herd, being still determined to get Chloe, chose a moment when Dryas was planting a tree to grow a vine upon in his garden. He knew him in old time when Dryas was a shepherd. He came laden with fine cheeses, which he begged Dryas to accept as a present, speaking the while of their ancient fellowship, and so leading up to the object of his visit, which was to ask Dryas to give him Chloe in marriage, blurting out with many words that he wished to make her his wife, promising handsome presents, which, being a neat herd, he could afford. He would like to give, he said, two draught oxen, four hives of bees, fifty trees of his apple orchard, an ox hide to make shoes of, and every year a calf just weaned. And so touched was Dryas by Dorkin's friendliness, and tempted by his promises, that he nearly agreed to the marriage. But he bethought him a moment afterwards that the girl was nobly born, and should not fall to the lot of a neat herd, and fearing her story might come to be known, and her parents learned that she had been bartered for a few gifts, and that this would bring great disgrace and misfortune upon him, he gave a civil refusal to all Dorkin's offers, and showed him through the gate. And Dorkin, seeing his hopes dashed for the second time, and remembering that he had lost many excellent, rich cheeses, fell to thinking how, as soon as they were alone together, he would lay his hand upon Chloe. And calling to mind that one day it was Chloe and another day Daphnis that led the flocks to water, he cast about in his mind for a trick that he might play upon them, a trick worthy of a sharp-witted neat herd. He took the skin of a huge wolf, which, whilst prowling about the cows, had been tossed by the bull, and flung it over his back, hiding his arms and hands in the skin of the forelegs. The tail and the skin of the hind legs covered his thighs, and he wore the head of the beast as a warrior his helmet. And having transformed himself into a wolf as well he could, he crawled to the springhead where the she-goats and ewes came to drink at evening. The deep valley through which the water flowed suited his purposes well, for all about were briars and brambles, thistles and juniper bushes, the very sort of covert in which a wolf would choose to lie in wait. There Dorkin lay hidden, waiting for the hour when the animals came to drink, in good hope that in the form of a wolf he would frighten Chloe, and seizing her body, take his pleasure of it. Nor had he long to wait. She came leading the two flocks, having left Daphnis cutting some tender branches to feed his goats come from the grass. The dogs that helped her to keep the flocks in good order followed, and as they hunted, sniffing in every bush, they came upon the trail of Dorkin and presently heard him crawling among the briars, ready to seize on the girl. A moment after they were barking and rushing upon him, as upon a wolf, biting the wolfskin and tearing it with their teeth. Frightened, but afraid to move, he crouched in the thicket, keeping silence through shame and striving to keep the wolfskin between him and them. But Chloe, terrified as she caught sight of the wolf, cried aloud to Daphnis for help, and when the dogs, having torn from Dorkin the wolfskin, began to bite him with good will, he too began to cry aloud and to pray Chloe and Daphnis, who had now come running, to help him. They soon called off and quieted the dogs, and the unhappy Dorkin was dragged out and led to the wellhead, where his bitten thighs and shoulders were bathed and dressed with the chewed bark of an elm, the only remedy that the children knew of. So innocent were they of all the wiles and maneuvers that Eros employs to gain his end, that no thought came to them that Dorkin had hid himself in the wolfskin, with any other intent than to play a merry prank upon them, and full of compassion, they led him part of his way, encouraging him with kind words. And he, who had been rescued not from the jaws of a wolf, such was the story he was likely to tell, but from the jaws of dogs, shuffled homeward, stopping from time to time to retie Chloe's dressings of his wounds. And after he had gone, Daphnis and Chloe were busy until the closing in of night gathering their scattered flocks, for the she-goats and ewes were so terrified by the wolf-skin and by the loud barking of the dogs that they had run up the steeps and crags and down to the shores of the sea. They no longer heeded the voice of their shepherd, 
and he piped in vain to flocks that erstwhile were obedient to a mere clapping of hands. All the she-goats had learned seemed to have passed from them, and to collect them was a long labour, but all were gathered within the fold at last, and Daphnis and Chloe, going to their beds, slept soundly, and in weariness at ease from the pain of love. But with the coming of day, passion awoke in them again, the pleasure of meeting at dawn, and the sorrow of quitting at dusk. They wished for something, and knew not what they craved for. Only this did they know, one that his sickness was begotten by a kiss, the other by the sight of a bather. The sun heat inflamed them the more, for the year was now passing out of the cool of the spring into the beginning of summer, when all is in sap, when the trees begin to show their fruits, and when the corn is in ear, when the voice of the cicala is heard in the branches, when the bleeding of the ewes tells of the richness of the fields, and the perfumed air is delightful to breathe. The streams seem asleep, so silently do they flow. The winds seem like organs and flutes, so sweetly do they sigh through the branches of the pines. The apples are raped from the branches by the sun, their lover. Daphnis, overcome by the heat, threw himself into the river. Sometimes he washed himself, sometimes he splashed after the fish which escaped his clutching hand, and sometimes he stooped to drink as if with water he sought to quench the fire within him. Chloe milked the ewes, and many of Daphnis's she-goats, but for a long time she could not get the milk to curdle, so tormented was she by the flies. She drove them away, but they returned with a vicious buzz, biting her. However, the milk would at last begin to curdle, and then she washed her face, and crowned with tender branches of the pine, and girdled with the fawn skin, she filled a piggin with wine and milk, and they drank together. Before noon, they were more ardently in love than ever, for Chloe seeing in naked Daphnis beauty perfectly accomplished, was overcome in all her senses, and thought she would die of love. And he, seeing her girdled with the fawn skin, and crowned with a crown of pine needles, holding a piggin for him to drink from, thought he saw one of the nymphs themselves come from their cave. And going to her he took her crown, kissed it first, and then put it on his own head, and she, whilst he bathed naked, took his gown and wore it, after having kissed it first, just as he had done. Sometimes they threw apples at one another, sometimes adorned their heads and plaited each other's hair, Chloe saying that Daphnis's locks were black like myrtle, and Daphnis answering that Chloe's face was like an apple, for it was white and red. He taught her to play on the pipe, and every time she began to blow into it, he caught it from her and then ran his lips over the pipe from one end to the other, pretending that he would correct a mistake, but in truth to get a chance to kiss her by proxy, kissing the flute in the places where it had left her mouth. And one noontide, it happened that after playing his pipe gladly within hearing of the flocks resting in the shadow, Chloe dropped off to sleep whilst listening, and Daphnis, seeing this, laid aside his pipe so that he might admire and contemplate and being without shame, he said, How her eyes sleep! How her mouth breathes! Neither flowering apple nor thorn trees breathe so sweet a breath. But I dare not kiss her. Her kiss stings to the heart and maddens like new honey. And to awake her I am afraid. O oh, noisy cicalas, she cannot sleep. So loudly do you sing. On the other side the goats do not cease to fight, and the clashing of horns will awake her. O oh, wolves, more cowardly than foxes, where are you now? Why are you not here to put an end to their broiling? Now, whilst he was in the midst of thoughts like these, a cicala, followed by a swallow, sought refuge in Chloe's bosom, and the swallow, that could not stay her hurried flight, swept with her wing Chloe's face, who, not knowing what had happened, started from her sleep and cried aloud, but when she saw the swallow flying nearby and Daphnis laughing at her, she lost her fear, rubbing her eyes, still full of sleep. And then the cicala began to sing between her breasts, as if it would give thanks for the sudden saving of its life, again frightening Chloe, who cried aloud, Daphnis laughing at her the while. And seeing that his chance had come, he searched in her bosom, 
withdrawing the gentle Sakala, which could not keep silent although he held it in his hand. Chloe was glad to see it, and having kissed it, replaced it, singing, within her breasts. On another time they heard a wood pigeon singing in the branches, and Chloe, taking pleasure in the murmur, asked Daphnis what the bird was saying, and Daphnis told her some of the old knowledge of the country. Once on a time, sweet maid, there was a maiden beautiful as thou art beautiful, and just of an age with thee. She loved to sing, and her cows delighted in her song. She ruled with her voice only, never striking out with her staff or thrusting with the goad, but sitting in the shadow of a pine, wearing a coronal of the same, she sang of Pan and Petus, and the cows were content to remain within hearing of her singing. Not far off was a neat herd, handsome as she, and one that sang as well, who setting himself to sing against her, and having more voice, being a male, and his voice being as soft as hers, for he was young, succeeded in luring away from her eight of her finest cows. The poor shepherdess, as much grieved at seeing her herd diminish as she was to hear herself outdone in singing, prayed to the gods that she might be changed into a bird before returning home. Her desire was granted, and she was changed into yonder mountain bird that loves to sing as she did when she was a girl. And her complaint is, as she flies to and fro, that she is searching for her wandering cows. Such were their summer pleasures, but when autumn was by again, and the grape was ripe, certain Tyrian pirates, voyaging about in a carrion ship, so that they might not be known to be barbarians, landed on the coasts, and came up country, a well-armed band, with breastplates hung over their shoulders and swords on their thighs, pillaging all they could lay hands upon, such as fine-flavored wine, rich grain, honeycombs, and many cattle were robbed from Dorkin's herd. As they went hither and thither, they came upon Daphnis driving his goats by the sea alone, for Chloe was afraid of the rough shepherds, and more slowly led Dryas's ewes to pasture. And seeing this handsome lad, and judging him to be more saleable than anything they could rob from the fields, they wasted no more time in following she-goats and robbing shepherds of their small stores of fruits and grain and honeycombs, but dragged Daphnis into the ship, weeping and crying loudly to Chloe, loudly as he could call. They had hardly scrambled into their ship and loosed, and were laying their oars into the sea, when Chloe, seeking Daphnis, she was bringing him a new flute, came upon the scattered flock, and hearing Daphnis's voice crying to her ever more loudly, she threw the flute aside, and thought no more about the flock, but ran to Dorkin to beg him to come to the help of Daphnis. She found him on the ground, bathed in blood, for the pirates had stabbed him again and again, and from his wounds so much blood had come that he now could hardly breathe. But when he saw Chloe, some of his strength returned to him. "'Chloe, my beloved,' said he, "'I am going to die very soon. "'I sought to save my cattle from these wicked thieves "'who have used me as thou seest. "'But do thou, Chloe, save Daphnis. "'To revenge me let the rogues perish. "'I have taught my cows to follow the sound of my flute, "'and however far they may have gone, "'they will return at the sound of it. "'Go to the seashore with this flute,' and play the tune that I taught Daphnis, and that he taught thee, and what falls out shall be accounted to the flute and the cattle yonder, and the flute itself I give thee. With it I prevailed over many shepherds and neat herds. And for all this I ask but one thing. Kiss me before I go. Weep for me when I am dead. And of all, when thou seest a neat herd watching his beasts feed in the fields, let him recall to thee, some remembrance of me. And having spoken these words, and gotten a kiss from her on the lips, his voice ended, and life passed from him. And Chloe put his flute to her mouth, and blew into it loudly as she was able, and the cows heard, and knew the note of the song, and lowing threw themselves into the sea. And as they all sprang from the same side, the ship leaned over, and water poured in, and the ship sank, those that were in her rising to the surface, but not all with the same hopes of reaching the shore. 
for the brigands had on their shoulders breastplates and on their thighs swords, and their boots reached halfway up their legs, whereas Daphnis was unshod, like a shepherd who leads his flock in the plain, and half-naked as the season demanded, for it was still hot. So the pirates, after having swum a little way, were sunk by their armor beneath the waves, whereas Daphnis, having released himself from all vesture, swam whilst the pirate rogues were sinking about him. But never having swum in the sea before, only in rivers, he found it hard to make headway. But his necessity prompting him, he swam between two cows, and holding on to their horns, his arms extended. He was carried by them without trouble, as easily as if he was riding in a chariot. For the kind swim longer than any man. None surpasses them in the water, unless indeed the seabirds or fish themselves. Such strong swimmers are they that we have no knowledge of any ox or cow being drowned till the sea water has melted their hooves. Wherefore many straits of the sea, even to this day, are called Bosporus, which means crossings or passages for cattle. And that is how Daphnis was saved from two great dangers, from slavery and from drowning. And coming to the shore where Chloe stood laughing and weeping, they fell into each other's arms, he asking why she had played the flute, and Chloe telling him everything, that she had run to fetch Dorkin, who told her how his cows were taught to return at the sound of his flute, and that he had told her how to play it, and that he was dead. Only through fear or shame she withheld from him that she had kissed Dorkin. A silence fell, and they sat thinking how the memory should be honored of him who had done them such kindness, and they went with parents and friends to bury the unlucky neat herd, throwing into the grave much earth and planting about it perennial plants, trees, and flowers, hanging on the branches offerings they had gathered from the fields. And they poured milk upon the grave and crushed great bunches of grapes, and left many broken flutes. Whereupon was heard the sorrowful lowing of kine, and very soon the cows came running hither and thither, and the distracted herd seemed to the shepherds like a portent, and the lowing a lament for the dead master. And the funeral of Dorkin being over and done, Chloe brought Daphnis to the cavern of the nymphs, where she washed him, and there for the first time Daphnis looking on, she washed her own white body, pure in its loveliness, and needing no cleaning to make it more lovely. And together they culled the season's flowers, made crowns for the statues of the nymphs, tied Dorkin's flute as an offering against the rock, and then suddenly bethought themselves of their she-goats and ewes, and whilst faring came upon them all lying scattered in their pasture, neither feeding nor bleeding, be like missing Daphnis and Chloe so long away. But when the twain appeared and called to them, and they heard the customary tunes on the pipes, they rose at once, the ewes to feed, and the she-goats to skip and jump whilst bleeding, as if to welcome the return of their herdsmen. But Daphnis was sullen and subdued, for he had seen Chloe naked, and discerning shapes in her beauty that he knew not of before, a sickness came upon him, and there was a gnawing as of a poison always at his heart. He often gasped for breath, as if he were pursued by an enemy. Chloe's bath was more redoubtable than the sea, and when he turned over on his pillow, it seemed to him that he had been robbed of his soul by brigands. So it was with this young boy, reared in the fields, who knew nothing of love's brigandage. End of section one. Section 2 of The Pastoral Loves of Daphne and Chloe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pastoral Loves of Daphne and Chloe by Longus. Translated by George Moore. Book the Second. Now, autumn being at the full and the harvest ripe, Everybody was in the fields, some to repair the wine presses, others to scour the vats and hogsheads, others were cleaning the wine jars, others again were sharpening pruning knives, some were weaving baskets, others were carrying out great stones for the crushing of the grapes, others were trying dry rods 
from which the bark had been stripped into bundles, for they would need torches to light them during the night whilst drawing off the must. Wherefore Daphnis and Chloe had to forego leading their flocks to the fields for the time being and work with the others. Daphnis carried great baskets of fruit to the presses. He helped to tread it and to fill the wine jars. Chloe was busy round the fires cooking meals for the vintagers, and when they left their work and came to her asking for drink, she gave them last year's wine dashed with water. And her cooking done, she did not delay in the house, but repaired to the vineyards, gathering the grapes within her reach. And nearly all were within it, for vines in Lesbos are trained low and not over high trees, and the branches leaning earthward spread hither and thither like ivy, so low that we might say a child just out of swaddling clothes could reach the clusters. At the feast of Bacchus, at the birth of wine, according to old custom, numbers of women came in from the fields to help, and all these cast their eyes upon Daphnis, and in praising him said, He is as beautiful as Bacchus. And one among them, more prompt than the others, kissed him, which kindled Daphnis, but Chloe was vexed. And the men in the wine presses cast many words after her as she passed them, and the sight of her caused a first stumping, like that of satyrs at the sight of a bacchante, and they were heard to say that they would be changed into sheep for the sake of being ruled and led by such a shepherdess, at which Chloe took pleasure, but Daphnis was vexed. And so it was that one and the other looked forward to the day when the vintage would be over, and they might return to the fields according to custom, and instead of the noise and the cries of the vintages, hear the sound of the flute and the bleeding of the flock. And not many days had passed over when all was done, the last grapes gathered and crushed under foot, the wine drawn off into the jars and sealed with oil, and Daphnis and Chloe being no longer needed, they led the flocks to the fields as before, and bringing to the nymphs the first fruits for offerings, great clusters hanging on the branches, they worshipped with great joy and exultation as they had always done. For never through idleness had they neglected in the mornings, as soon as the flocks had begun to graze, to worship, and in the evenings, returning from the pasture, they adored again. And never did they pass without bringing some offerings, flowers, fruits, or a fresh branch, or a libation of milk, after which they looked for some recompense from the goddesses. And then they frolicked like young hares, jumping and fluting together, and sang to the box and kids, and wrestled one against the other. And it so happened, whilst they were thus happy, that one day an old man, wearing a worn hat woven out of goat's hair, with clogs on his feet, Old, too, was his wallet as the rest, sat down beside them and began to speak to them. I am the old Philetus, children, who in former times sang many songs to the nymphs. Many times have I played the flute to God Pan, and have led many great herds of cattle by the flute alone. And I come to you now to tell you what I have seen and what I have heard. I have a garden that I planted and have cared for, cropped and trimmed ever since old age fell upon me, and I no longer could lead flocks to the fields. All that anybody may wish for comes to this garden in its appointed time. In the springs, roses, lilies, violets, single and double. In summer, poppies, pears and apples of many different kinds and the autumn season having returned, there are grapes and figs and pomegranates and green myrtles, and come thither every morning great flocks of birds, some to feed, some to sing, for it is thickly planted with trees, and there are three fountains, and if the fencing wall were removed, you would think the garden was a wood. Today at noon, as I entered, I saw a young boy under the myrtles and pomegranates, with pomegranates and myrtles in his hands, white as milk, 
hair red as fire, smooth and clean, as if he had just been washed. He was naked, he was alone, and whilst playing, he gathered many fruits as if the orchard belonged to him. Wherefore I ran after him, afraid lest in his frolics and friskiness he would break some plant. But he escaped easily from my hands, sometimes slipping under the roses, sometimes hiding under the poppies, as if he was a little partridge. In old time I often had to run after sucking kids, and very often run hard, seeking to catch the calves as they gambled about the cow. But this boy was more difficult to catch than they, and being old I was soon tired out, and leaning upon my stick, watchful lest he should escape, I asked him to what neighbour he belonged, and by what right he came to gather fruits in another man's garden. He answered nothing, but drawing near he took to smiling prettily, whilst throwing grains of myrtle at me, which I know not why nor how, softened and inclined my heart towards him, so that I very soon wished no evil to befall him. Then I asked him to come to me without fear, swearing by my myrtles that I would let him go whither he listed, with apples and pomegranates that I would give him, and that I would allow him to take the fruits from my trees and gather my flowers. All that he wished, if in return, he would kiss me. At which, laughing gaily, with good and gentle grace, he began, in a voice so sweet and amiable that neither the swallow nor the nightingale, nor the swan, though old as I am, could speak more winningly. Philetus, said he, it would be no trouble to me to give thee a kiss, for it is more pleasure for me to kiss than for thee to be young again. But have a care that what thou askest from me should not be an evil gift and unsuitable to thy age, for thy years will not save thee from the desire to follow me once thou hast kissed me neither an eagle nor a falcon nor any other bird of prey however swift of wing he may be can take me i am not a child although i have all the appearance of one i am old as saturn older even than time i knew thee when thou wert in the flower of thy youth when thou wast herding in a reedy place a fine and fat herd of cows and i was near to thee when thou didst play the flute under the beech trees and didst love amaryllis but thou didst not see me though i was very close to thy sweetheart whom i gave to thee at last and thou hadst by her beautiful children which are now husbandmen and neat herds but my care is now for daphnis and chloe and after i have brought them forth in the morning together i come to thy orchard where I take my pleasure among the trees and the flowers, and bathe in thy fountains, and the plants and flowers in thy garden flourish so well, for they have drunk of my bath-water. Cast thine eyes about thee, and say if a branch is broken, or if any fruit has been plucked or spoiled, if any herb or flower has been trodden under foot, if any fountain has been soiled or muddied, and rejoice, old man, that alone amongst men who have reached thy years thou shouldst still wish for the child. At that he raised himself above the myrtles as easily as any nightingale, and hopping from branch to branch amid the leaves at last reached the top. I saw his little wings and his little bow and the arrows in his quiver, and then I saw no longer his arrows or himself. Now, if I have not lived for many empty years, losing my wits with advancing age, you may believe me, my children, that you are Eris's own, dedicated to him, and that he will watch over you. Pleasing to both of them were these words, as pleasing as if they were listening to a pleasant story, and they asked him what was Eros, if he were a bird or a child, and what power he had. Wherefore Philetus began to speak again. A god, my children, is this Eros. He is young, beautiful, and he has wings. He delights in youth, seeks beauty, gives wings to the soul, and is more powerful than Zeus himself. He rules in the stars and the elements, and leads even the gods with a crook as you lead your flocks. 
The flowers you see are the work of Eros. The plants and the trees are of his making. It is by him that the river flows and the winds blow. I have seen bulls in his power. They bellow as if a god fly had stung them. I have seen a buck in love with a she-goat. He followed her everywhere. Myself, when I was young, I loved Amaryllis, and remembered not to eat, nor to drink, nor to rest. My soul suffered, my heart quaked, my body shivered. I cried as if I was being beaten, and I was silent as a dead man. I threw myself into the rivers as if a fire was within me. I called upon Pan, who himself had been wounded by love of pities. I thanked Echo, who repeated, Amaryllis, after me, and I broke my flute because it could lead my cows, but could not bring Amaryllis to me. For there is no remedy, no beverage, no charm, no song, no words that can heal love's sickness. Only the kiss can do it embrace, lie together, flesh to flesh. Philetas, after having thus instructed them, received in payment from them some cheeses and a goat a year old. But when they were left alone, their souls were wrapped in pain, they having heard for the first time the name of Eros, and at night, returning to their homes, they compared their own estate with all that they had heard. Lovers suffer, we suffer. They are listless, and the same it is with us. They cannot sleep, and we do not close our eyelids. They think that they burn, and we have a fire within us. They desire to see each other, and we pray for the laggard day to return. This undoubtedly is love, and we do not know it. But if it be love that we feel, why are we so ill at ease? And of all, what do we seek for in one another? Philetus said truly, The young boy that he saw in his garden is the same that appeared long ago to our fathers and told them in a dream that we should be sent to the fields to watch poor flocks. How may he be caught? He is small and will slip out of our hands, and to escape from him is not possible, for he has got wings with which to overtake us. Shall we seek help from the nymphs? But Pan did not help Philetas when he was in love with Amaryllis. Let us therefore try the remedies that he spoke of, to kiss, to embrace, to lie together flesh to flesh. It is cold, but we will endure it as well as did Philetas. Next day at daybreak they led their flocks to the fields and kissed as soon as they met, which they had never done before and opening their arms they were mingled in one embrace. But they did not dare the last remedy to lie naked, it seeming to them too bold a one, not only for a young shepherdess like Chloe, but for a young goat herd. And the next night there was no rest for either one or the other. Both remembered what they had done, and were tormented by the thought of what they had omitted to do, saying to each other, we have kissed, and our kisses have not helped us. We have lain clasped in each other's arms, and nothing came of it. We can no longer doubt that to lie together is the true remedy for love. We must try it also, for of a certainty a kiss is not all. After such thoughts, their reveries, as is easily imagined, were of arrows and of kisses. And what they had not done in the day, they did in dreams, lying flesh to flesh. And morning came again, they rose more in love with each other than before, and driving their flocks with a whistle, they did not delay to repeat their kisses. Wherever they were, on catching sight of each other, they ran smiling one to the other to kiss and to embrace. But they had not yet tried the third remedy of which old Philetus had spoken, for Daphnis did not dare to speak of it, and Chloe neither, until it fortuned with them that they tried it. They were sitting under an oak close together, and had kissed without obtaining any relief thereof, and in their embraces, seeking to clasp each other closer, Daphnis held Chloe so tightly that without a thought she fell upon her side. Daphnis, following Chloe's mouth, 
not to lose the pleasure of the kiss, fell likewise upon his side, and, seeing in the postures they had fallen into unconsciously the shape of their dream, they remained a long while interlocked, clasping each other as tightly as if they were bound together, and it seeming to them that they had thus attained the highest joy that love could give, most of the day was passed till dusk fell in vain embraces, and then, hating the night, they separated and led their flocks to the fold. It might well be that more would have been done with good will if that day a great riot had not broken out on these coasts. Some young and rich men, gallants of Methymni, thinking to spend joyously the last days of the vintage, put forth in a ship and bade their servitude row them to the shores of Mytilene, attracted thither by the fame of the riches of fine sand, whence they could bathe, and the fine buildings with gardens, parks, and woods, the work of man and nature. And whilst sailing along the coasts, mooring whenever the desire to do so took them, they amused themselves with whatever came their way, without doing harm or giving annoyance to anybody. Sometimes they angled from a flat rock for rockfish, with hooks tied by a light cord to reed canes. At other times they took with their dogs and their nets hares that fled from the vines, driven out by the noise of the gatherers, or they went after birds, finding time and place favourable, catching with running nooses wild geese and young ducks and bustards, which, beyond the pleasure of the chase, furnished them with food. If they needed anything else, they bought it at the nearest village, paying the full price, and beyond it, for bread and for wine and for lodging, for it did not seem to them safe, the season being autumn, to sleep on board. And the ship was drawn on shore, lest peradventure a storm might arise during the night. Now it happened that some country churl, wanting a rope to haul up the stone wherewith he was grinding grapestones, his own being broken or worn, sneaked down to the sea, and, finding no one on board, untied the rope that moored the ship, and brought it home to serve his business. In the morning the young man sought their rope vainly, and, nobody confessing to having taken it, they quarrelled with their hosts, and put forth again. And having rowed for two leagues, they landed, the fields where Daphnis and Chloe were watching their flocks, seeming to them to offer good opportunities for hare-hunting but not having any rope to moor their ship, they bethought themselves to cut up osiers, and twisting a withy out of these, and thinking their ship to be safe, they slipped their dogs and laid their toils in the paths where they thought the game would run. The dogs running hither and thither, barking, frightened Daphnis's she-goats, sending them scampering down from the hillsides to the sea, and finding nothing to eat in the sands, some more daring than the others came to the ship, and gnawed through the bands a withy by which she was moored, and a wind rising inland, the sea became soon after ruffled, and the ship, being now free, was carried out by the waves far from the shore into the offing. And seeing what was happening, the hunters ran to the shore, others gathering their dogs, and all together making such a noise that the folk, shepherds and vine dressers came from all sides but there was nothing to be done for the wind was freshened and the ship being taken out to sea soon passed out of sight whereupon the young gallants of mythimni were woeful and having lost their ship and all that was in it they bethought themselves of the goat-herd who should have kept a more careful watch on his goats and seeing Daphnis, they fell to coughing and stripping him, and one amongst them held his hands and began to bind them with a dog-slip. He fought and cried and implored the folk to come to his help, and of all he implored Lamen and Drias to rescue him. And these two brawny old men, their hands hardened in the work of the fields, undertook to defend Daphnis against the young Methemians urging that they should listen to the lad to see wherein he was blameworthy, and others urging the same, finally the neat herd Philetus was chosen to judge the case, he being the oldest man present, and one of much repute in his village for righteous judgment. 
and first the men of Mithimni made their accusation in brief plain words, addressing the herdsman as judge. We came into these fields to hunt, and having left our ship safely moored by a rope twisted out of green sallow, we went away with our dogs in quest of game, and these man's goats came down to the sea and gnawed the green cable and set loose the ship, and yourself saw it carried out to sea and can guess what we have lost cloaks hats dogs collars and leashes and as much money as would buy all these fields and to make good our losses we do not think it else than reasonable to be allowed to carry off this worthless goat herd who brings his goats to feed along the shores as a sailor might so spoke the mithimnians daphnis was sore with blows and buffetings but catching sight of chloe made light of them and spoke thus i keep a good guard over my goats and nobody in the village has ever complained that one of them has barked a tree in a garden or broken a vine shoot but these men are inexperienced hunters and their dogs are not well trained for they run hither and thither barking loudly and at nothing so that my goats took fright and to escape them run from the plain and from the hill down to the sea as they might from wolves well my goats have eaten through a rope of twisted osiers what else could they do on the shore where there is neither shrub nor time for them to eat the ship is lost at sea let a storm account for the loss and not my goats which were not the cause of it it is said that there were rich clothes collars dog slips and much money aboard her but who will believe that a boat laden so richly would be left alone tied to the shore by a withy whilst speaking tears started to his eyes and all the folk were sorry for him and philetus who should pronounce his sentence swore by god pan and the nymphs that daphnis had done no wrong nor had his goats and that the fault if fault there was should be charged to the wind and the sea and that he did not hold himself as one who could properly judge these nevertheless the good philetus could not persuade the methymnians to accept his judgment and when in anger they seized daphnis again and began to tie his hands and to carry him away the villagers rose up of a sudden like a flock of starlings or daws and took daphnis from them who when he had freed his hands attacked with the others and assailing them with their staves they turned them to flight and ceased not until they had driven them over their borders and when they were gone in the pursuit in the quietness that followed chloe led daphnis to the cavern of the nymphs where she bathed his face which was covered with the blood that had flowed from his nose then taking from her wallet some cheese and cake she gave him to eat thereof and what most of all restored him gave him with her tender mouth a kiss sweet as honey so did daphnis escape the danger but the end of the strife was not yet come for the gallants from methymni returning on foot whence they had come in a fine ship wounded and torn instead of a gay party seeking pleasure made application to the town council to whom they came in humble weed and downcast faces to beg vengeance for the outrage that had been committed upon them taking care to put a different colour upon all lest they should be exposed to laughter for having allowed themselves to be beaten by shepherds accusing loudly the mytilineans of having robbed them and stolen their boat by force just as they might have done in open warfare their wounds bore testimony to the truth of the story they told and the methymnians believing it to be a just and right thing to avenge the outrage that had been committed upon the children of the noblest families of their town declared war upon the mytilineans without troubling to send a herald or declaration of war merely ordering their general to put to sea promptly with ten galleys and to do as much damage to their coasts as he might for it was thought that it would not be wise to risk a more numerous fleet winter being so near the next day he put to sea and not wishing to overcrowd his ships he manned the oars with the soldiers and a few hours later they were ravaging the coast lands of the mytilineans whence they raped much cattle and grain and wine the vintage now being over 
and of the vintagers too not a few fell into their hands they rode toward the fields where daphnis and chloe led their flocks and overrunning the country took all they could find now daphnis was not there with his flock but had gone up into the wood for green branches to feed his young goats in the winter and seeing from the tree-tops the Mithymnians in the plain he hid himself in the hollow of an oak chloe who remained with her flock thought she might escape by running and took refuge in the cave of the nymphs but was followed thither by the soldiers whom she begged in the name of the nymphs not to harm her or her flock but she pleaded in vain for the methymnians after having railed at and mocked the images of the nymphs took her and her flock with them driving her before them with a switch as if she were a she-goat or a yoke and seeing that their ships were laden with spoil they sought to take no more but returned homeward afraid lest they might be overtaken by storms or enemies and so they rowed away putting all their strength into their oars for there was not wind enough on the sea to fill a sail and when all the uproar had ceased daphnis drew himself out of the hollow of the oak and came to the edge of the wood and finding neither his goats nor chloe's yews but only the empty fields and the flute with which chloe beguiled herself thrown aside he began to cry and to weep and then to sigh bitterly running now to the oak where they were accustomed to sit now to the shore in the hope of finding her and now he went to the cave of the nymphs to whom she had run for refuge and throwing himself on the ground he reproached the nymphs saying that they had failed him in the hour of need chloe said he was torn from your altars and your hearts must be hard to have seen this wrong done to her who wove for you so many beautiful garlands of flowers who always brought you the first milk who gave you the pipe that i see hanging there a wolf never robbed me of a single goat and our enemies have robbed me of my whole flock and chloe my fellow shepherd and companion my goats they will kill and skin off hand the yews they will offer in sacrifice to the gods and chloe will live for evermore in some town far from me how dare i come before my father and mother without my goats without chloe what will become of me for there are no more goats for me to lead wherefore i will not stir from here but wait for death or for mine enemies to return and take me with them and chloe art thou suffering too as i am art thou thinking of the fields and art thou mindful of the nymphs and me or dost thou find some light comfort in thy yews and in my goats made prisoners with thee as he spoke these words his heart heavy with grief and tears he fell into a deep sleep and in his sleep appeared to him the three nymphs women tall and fair half naked with unsandaled feet hair scattered over their shoulders in the likeness of their statues and at first they seemed to pity daphnis and then the eldest among them said to comfort him complain not of us daphnis chloe is our care even more than she is thine we took pity on her when she was born and abandoned in this cave and by our help she was succoured and reared and thou shouldst know that chloe has nothing in common with Trias and his yaws and even now we have provided that she shall not be carried as a slave to methymni nor be a part of the spoil of war pan whose image is under that pine and whom ye never honoured even with flowers we have prayed that he may succour chloe for he is more used than we to armed hosts and he himself often leaves the quiet of the fields to make war at this moment he is gone against the methymnians a baneful foeman wherefore be not afflicted rise and show thyself to lamon and myrtali who have thrown themselves on the ground believing that thou too hast been part of the booty taken on the morrow chloe will return to thee with her flocks and thy she-goats too will return and you shall watch over them as heretofore and play on the flute together afterwards eros shall have charge of you 
Daphnis, having heard and seen these things, awoke suddenly, and sitting up he wept as much with joy as with sadness. He threw himself before the image of the nymphs, and adored and promised them that if Chloe were returned to him safely, he would sacrifice the fattest of his she-goats. And then, running to the pine under which God Pan was shown with the hoofs of a buck, two horns on his head, one hand holding a flute and the other staying a young goat, he adored him also and begged him to come promptly to the help of Chloe, making him the same promise that he would sacrifice a back to him. And to the end of the day, till the setting of the sun, he did not cease to weep and to cry for the return of Chloe. At last, gathering the boughs he had cut in the woods, he returned home to relieve the great sorrow of Lamon and Myrtale, and fill their hearts with bliss. Then, after tasting food, he turned to his bed, in which he wept, praying unceasingly that the nymphs should appear to him again, and that the day should return, and with the day, according to their promise, Chloe. Never did a night seem so long to him before, but in it all that he asked was accomplished. The leader of the Methymnians, having rowed about three-quarters of a league, bethought himself that it would be well that his tired soldiery should rest, and seeing a promontory stretching into the sea, crescent-shaped, within which the sea would let his ships ride safer than in any harbour, he cast anchor. And deeming himself safe from any mischief the peasants could do him, he bade his crews make merry, and they, having on board abundance of plunder, began to eat and drink and make festival like people who had won a great victory. But as soon as the day was gone, and the night began to make an end of jollity, it seemed to them, suddenly, that the earth was on fire, and that they heard a great noise coming from the high seas, which they judged to be the oars of a great fleet coming against them. One watcher cried, To arms! and they called to one another. One thought that he was already wounded, another saw a man stretched dead before him, whereupon a great tumult arose. It seemed like a night battle, although there was no enemy there, and after this ghostly night the day came and they were frightened again, for they saw the horns of Daphnis's she-goats and he-goats twisted with branches of ivy and hang with grapes. They heard the yaws and the rams of Chloe howling like wolves, and Chloe herself they saw crowned with branches of pine needles. And on the sea were haps and prodigies fearsome to tell, for when they strove to raise their anchors, the anchors seemed held, and when they put out their oars, the oars cracked and broke. Dolphins rose from the sea and surrounded their ships, the planks of which were opened. So great was the splashing of their tails. From the height of the rock the sound of a seven-reeded flute, such as shepherds play, was heard, and those who heard it were frightened by it, as by the unexpected sound of a bugle. A marvellous fear was put upon them, which made them run to their arms, and though no enemy was visible, they cried aloud, Our enemies are upon us! and they desired that the night should come and relieve them of their fear, a truce from reality or phantoms, they knew not which. Yet whosoever kept his senses, or any part of them, might very easily have guessed that the wonders of the night had been brought about by Pan, angry with them for some evil they had done. But they had neither touched nor taken anything wittingly that belonged to him, and terror prevailed among them till midday, when a great sleep fell upon their captain, one that they could not doubt had been sent from on high, and in this sleep Pan appeared to him and spoke these words. O oh, wicked men and impious, how dare ye with tumult and show of arms invade my beloved fields to rape away the flocks under my protection and to carry off from a holy place a young girl around whom errors would weave a mythic story? And have you no reverence for the nymphs who saw you do these things, nor for me who am the god Pan? Never will ye see again Methymne if ye carry away all this booty, nor escape from the sound of my flute. 
which has wrought amongst you so much confusion. Food for fish I will make all of you, if thou dost not straightway give back Chloe to the nymphs and all her yaws and the flock of goats. Rouse at once without delay, set the maiden on land and all that I have named, and when thou hast done all this, I will conduct you on your voyage and her too on her way. Briaxis, for so he was named, raised himself and awoke tremblingly, and at once an order was sent to the captain of each galley that a search would be made among the prisoners for Chloe, the young shepherdess. This was done, and she was found, sitting, wearing on her head a crown of pine needles. She was brought before the captain, and seeing that her resemblance tallied with the vision of his dream, he himself brought her to land on his own ship, and no sooner was she on shore than from the high rock the sound of the flute was heard again, no longer martial and terrible, but in dulcet strains, like those with which shepherds are accustomed to lead their flocks to the fields, and no sooner were the yaws put at liberty than they ran down the scale of the ship, their hoofs not slipping, and the she-goats still more boldly, inasmuch as they were used to tread in steep places. And then the two flocks encircled Chloe, bounding, skipping, and bleating as if they rejoiced with her in their common deliverance. But the flocks of other shepherds and goat-herds remained in the holds of the gullies, as if the music of the pipe did not call to them, at which everybody wondered, and praised the goodness and the power of Pan. And stranger things still happened in sea and land, for the galleys of the Methymnians unloosed themselves before the anchors were raised, and a dolphin led them, leaping out of the water before the leading galley, and on land a pleasing and soft sound of a pipe conducted the two flocks, though nowhere to be seen was the pipe-player and the yaws and the she-goats trotted and grazed as if the melody was pleasing in their ears. It was at the hour when flocks are led to the fold after midday, and Daphnis, seeing from his outlook Chloe with the two flocks, cried, O oh, nymphs, O oh, Pan, and ran towards her, and threw himself into her arms, taken with so great a joy that he fell breathless and Chloe pressed him against her bosom, and her kisses were barely sufficient to restore him to himself. When he had regained his wits, they went away together to their accustomed oak, and sitting by her he could not do else than ask her how she had escaped from the hands of so many enemies. And Chloe told him everything, how they had followed her into the cave, how she had been raped away from the cave and carried on board a ship, of the ivy coming on the horns of the she-goats, and the crown of pine needles on her head, of the howling of her yaws, the fire of the high rock, the noise in the sea, and the different tones of the flute that were played, one of peace and the other of war, and then how a sweet melody had led her all the way without her seeing anything. And then Daphnis, understanding the dreams he had had of the nymphs and the power of Pan, told Chloe all he had heard and all he had seen, and how, when he was in the nick of death, the nymphs had delivered him. Then he sent her to fetch the households of Dreas and Laman, and what was needful for the sacrifice, and himself, meanwhile, chose the fattest she-goat of his flock, and when he had wound her horns with ivy in the same manner as the whole flock had appeared to the enemy, and poured milk between the horns, he sacrificed to the nymphs. The goat was hung and flayed, and the skin consecrated. And when Chloe returned, bringing with her Dreas and Lamon and their wives, he roasted part of the flesh and boiled the rest. But before any had partaken of it, a share was set aside for the nymphs, and having filled the pitcher with sweet wine, he poured a libation to them. And then he made several beds of leaves and green boughs for his guests, and he and they fell to eating and drinking, his eyes, however, often raised between whiles in dread, lest a wolf should rush from a thicket. And having eaten to fullness, they began to sing the solemn carols to the nymphs composed by ancient shepherds ages ago, and the night coming on, they lay in the fields. And the next day, not being without memory of Pan, the he-goat, the chief of the flock, 
was taken and crowned with branches of pine and led to the pine and under pan's own image whilst praises were offered to pan a libation of wine was poured out and the he-goat was sacrificed hung up and flayed then part of the flesh was boiled part roasted and laid along the banks of the green meadow hard by and the skin and the horns they pegged to the pine by the statue a pastoral offering to a pastoral god nor were they forgetful to leave the first and chiefest parts for Pan, and the accustomed libations were poured in his honour. Chloe sang, Daphne played his flute, they all took their places at the feast, and it fell out that old Philetas brought Pan some garlands of flowers and bundles of vine branches with grapes and leaves and vine shoots, and with him came his youngest son, Titerus, fair and ruddy, mischievous and alert who ran untiringly skipping like a kid all rose to meet the newcomers and they went together to crown pan and to hang on the pine the branches and the garlands that the good philetus had brought then place was made for him amongst them and food set before him when old men have drunk a little they begin to tell the stories of their youth how they kept their flocks in the fields how they escaped many dangers and avoided being taken by sea robbers and thieves one of the company boasted that he had killed the wolf another that none could play the flute as well as he save only pan and this being the brag of philetus daphnis and chloe begged of him to show a little of his skill for their pleasure and the delight of the god to whom they had made sacrifice and who loved the sound of the flute Philetus consented, and whilst regretting that his breath was shorter than of yore, he took Daphnis's flute from him, but this proved to be too small for him to exhibit his skill upon it. It was the flute of a boy, wherefore he sent Titerus to his shilling, half a league distant, to fetch his flute. The lad, throwing off his jacket, ran thither swift as a fawn or hind and between whiles Lamon began to tell them the story of Pan and Syrinx, which he had learned from a Sicilian shepherd, who knew the song at the cost of a goat and a flute. Syrinx, now a pastoral flute, was once a beautiful young girl with a lovely voice and great musical gift. She watched her flocks and sang and played with the nymphs, till one day Pan, seeing her in the fields watching her flocks, playing and singing, came to her and tried to persuade her to what he wanted and for doing this he promised that he would make her she-goats bear twins every year but she laughed at his love and said that she did not want any lover nor a he-goat nor any man entire so pan sought to take her by force but syrinx ran away both from pan and his forcing and running away she got tired hid in reeds disappeared in a marsh pan was angry cut the reeds and not finding the maiden and seeing what had happened invented the instrument joining unequal reeds for their love was unequal so she who was once a beautiful maiden is now a pipe that gives music lamon had hardly finished his story and philetus had not finished praising it saying that he had never heard in his life so beautiful a fable when titerus arrived with his father's great flute made of thick reeds clamped with brass above the wax fastenings in so much that one would have thought it was pan's own flute the first flute of all philetus rose and seating himself upright on the bank first tried the pipes to make sure that there was no stoppage anywhere and seeing that every reed gave its true sound he blew into his pipe and so full and strong were the notes he produced that any one would have thought he heard many pipes playing together then little by little with diminished breath he blew his music becoming turn and turn about soft and pleasant exhibiting all the changes of pastoral music the music to be played to a herd of cattle the sounds that become a goat herd and the music loved of yaws and sheep how that of the yaws is gracious and grave whilst that of the cattle and the goats is clear and sharp 
One flute can therefore imitate the different flutes of the shepherd, the neat herd, and the goat herd. The company seated on the green bank listened in silence, taking great pleasure in hearing Philetus play, till Drias, rising up, begged of him to play some gay song in honour of Bacchus, whilst he danced a dance of the vintage, miming as he stepped it the gathering of the grapes from the vine the hod man carrying away the grapes on his shoulder, and then the vintager who trod the grapes under foot, and he was followed by the miming of him who poured the wine into jars, and of the man who drinks with good will, and fearlessly of the new wine. And all these things he performed in his mimic dance, so plainly and with such grace that it seemed to the company that they had before them the vine, the press, and the jars, and Drias drinking the sweet wine. And the third old man, having thus acquitted himself well in the dance, crossed over to Daphnis and Chloe, whom he kissed, and at once they rose and danced together the story that Lamon had related, Daphnis taking the part of God Pan, and Chloe of the beautiful nymph Syrinx. He woos and prays to win her, but she laughs and runs from him, he following, running on tiptoe, so imitating the gait of the buck, then she, feigning fatigue, and as if she could not run any further, hid herself in the wood, the stems of the trees doing duty for reeds, and then Daphnis played on the great flute and Philetus, drawing from it a sound, sad as the plaint of Pan for the maiden, and then a cry of passion, a prayer for love, and then the despairing call of one who knows not where to look for that which he seeks. And all this was so well done that Philetus, delighted and astonished, ran to kiss him, and after having kissed him gave him the flute as a gift, telling him that he, in his turn, must leave it to a worthy successor. Daphnis gave his own little flute to Pan, and having kissed Chloe, who had returned to him after unfeigned flight, he played whilst leading his flock back to the fold, for it was already late, and Chloe did the same, leading her flock by the sound of the same pipes, the goats walking side by side with the yaws, and Chloe close to Daphnis. And so until the close of night they had their fill of one another, and took counsel to lead their flocks earlier on the morrow, and so they did, going forth at the very dawn to the pasture and having saluted the nymphs and afterwards pan they sat beneath the oak and played the flute together still kissing and embracing they lay side by side and doing nothing more rose up again and then bethought themselves of their food they drank their wine mixed with milk out of the same jar and then inflamed and emboldened by all these things they contended in amory's argument seeking to make themselves safe against time and hap by plighting troth one to the other daphnis going under the pine and swearing by god pan that he could not live a day without chloe and chloe in the cave of the nymphs swore before the images to live and die with daphnis but she like a young and innocent maiden was simple enough to ask daphnis as they came out of the cave to swear another oath she said to him God Pan Daphnis is a flighty god in whom there is no trust. Oh, he loved Pitys, and he loved Syrinx, and he never ceases to annoy the nymphs who guard flocks, and he is always after the dryads. Now, if thou art not true to the faith thou hast plighted to me, he will but laugh, even if thou shouldst have more mistresses than he has reeds in his pipe. Swear to me by thy flock and by the she-goat, that suckled thee that thou wilt never leave chloe as long as she be faithful to thee and if she should be faithless to thee and to the nymphs fly from her hate her or kill her as thou wouldst a wolf daphnis was pleased by her jealousy and in the middle of his flock holding by one hand a buck and by the other a she-goat swore that he would love chloe as long as she loved him and that if it should fall out for her to love another he would kill himself instead of her, at which she was pleased and heartened more than she was by the first oath, for her belief was that yews and she-goats were the gods proper to shepherds and goat-herds. End of section 2
Section 3 of the Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe by Longus. Translated by George Moore. Book the Third. But when the Mytilineans heard that the Methymnians had sent ten ships to ravage their coasts, and when folk from the country came telling how their lands had been overrun and plundered, only one opinion prevailed amongst them, that these insults done to them should be avenged at once. And forthright three thousand foot and five hundred horse were sent overland against the Methymnians under the command of their captain, General Hippasus, it being thought hazardous to send them by sea so late in the year. The captain on his way thither refrained from ravaging the country of the Methymnians. Neither were the flocks and chattels of the peasants and shepherds plundered, for he deemed such acts to be those of a thief rather than of a captain, but marched straight for the town, hoping to find the gates open and unguarded. However, within six leagues of the town he was met by a herald asking for a truce in the name of the Methymnians for having since heard from their prisoners that the Metilineans knew nothing of what had happened, and that the cause of the war could be traced to a quarrel in which some peasants had treated their young men roughly, they, the Methymneans, regretted having ventured on sharper reprisals than was prudent, and were ready to restore all the booty they had taken, wishing to live in peace and to trade by land and sea without fear or danger. Hippasus, therefore, sent back a messenger to Mytilene, though absolute power had been granted to him to treat with the enemy, and encamping within half a league of Methymne, he waited to receive orders from his town. Two days afterwards orders were brought to him to accept all the stolen property as sufficient restitution, and to return without doing damage, for having had the choice between war and peace, they thought that peace was the better bargain and so terminated the war between Methymne and Metellini, not less suddenly than it had been begun. Now winter, bitterer than war to Daphnis and Chloe, filled the fields and the roads with snow, keeping the peasants within their houses. Floods flowed from the mountains and were frozen in their course. The trees were like dead trees, and nothing of the earth was seen except about the springheads and streams so they could not bring their flocks to the fields any longer nor put their noses out of doors but at cock-crow kindling a great fire some twisted thread others wove cloth of goat hair or contrived snares with which to catch birds much care was needed to keep the cattle alive to carry straw for them to eat it in the byre to find leafage for the she-goats and the yews in the fold and mast and acorns for the pigs in the styes. All the same, few reproaches were heard against grim winter, for both tillers and shepherds were glad to be free from their daily work in the fields. Good meals and long sleeps made winter seem sweeter than summer, autumn, or spring to all except Daphnis and Chloe, who could not keep out of their minds thoughts of the kisses exchanged under oak trees and pines, of happy moments in the fields and woods, and so vivid were their remembrances that they did not sleep at night, but lay awake thinking of the coming season. A rebirth it would be truly for them as for the world. On catching sight in the morning of the wallet in which they had carried their food, their hearts misgave them, and seeing the pitcher from which they had drunk in turn or a pipe, the gift of some bygone sweetheart, thrown into a corner, uncared for, forgotten, they were taken with sudden apprehension and regrets. So they prayed to the nymphs and to Pan to deliver them from the evil of cold days, and show the clear bright sunlight again to them and to their flocks, and while stuffering up prayers, they bethought themselves how they might see each other. Of course, Chloe could think of nothing, not altogether her fault, for she whom she believed to be her mother was always after her, talking to her of marriage, while showing her how to cart wool and to turn the spindle. But Daphnis, having more leisure and more wit than the maid, bethought him of a plan to see her. In front of Dryas's house, by the wall of the courtyard, were two great myrtles and an ivy bush. 
The myrtles were near one another, their stems almost touching, so that the ivy embraced the two, and spreading like a vine over one and the other, drawing the two together, it wove a roof of thick, shiny leaves, from which hung clusters of blackberries like grapes from a trellis, bringing hither multitudes of birds, who in the winter could find no food elsewhere. Hordes of blackbirds, hordes of thrushes, hordes of pigeons, hordes of starlings, and all the other birds that like ivy berries. On pretense of bird-catching, Daphnis left the house, his wallet filled with bread and cake, and to disarm suspicion completely, he carried pots of bird-lime and some snares. The distance between one house and the other was about half a league, and he found it hard to drag his feet through the deep soft snow, but love is not stopped by fire, water, nor even Scythian snows and Daphnis did the journey without drawing breath, and arriving at Dryas's cottage shook the snow from his legs, set his snares, smeared the ivy twigs with lime, and posted himself to watch for the coming of the birds, and peradventure for cloys. As to the birds, they came in great numbers, and he took as many as he cared to gather, to kill and to pluck, but nobody left the house, neither man nor woman nor cock nor hen, all were within doors, drawn up cosily by the fire, and poor Daphnis was in grief that he should have come at so unlucky a moment. He was for pushing through the doorway, could he but have thought of some excuse, and he turned over in his mind what he had better say. I have come to get a light. How? Have you no nearer neighbors? I ask for bread. But thy wallet is full of food. Some wine but the vintage is only a little time past. A wolf followed me. But where is the track? I want to see Chloe. But such a confession could not be made to a father and to a mother, and of all these pretexts everyone would awaken suspicion. It will be better that I should go home. I shall see here in the spring, not in the winter, since the gods don't wish it, and they do not seem as if they did. And having talked in this way to himself, and gathered up all he had taken of thrushes and other birds, he started on his way. But as if love had pity upon him, this is what happened. Dryas and his family were at table. The bread, the meat, the wine were before them, and so intent was everybody on eating and drinking, that one of the sheep-dogs, seeing his chance, snatched a lump of meat and fled with it from the house. Dryas, very angry, for had not the dog taken his share of the food, caught up his stick and ran after him, and whilst chasing his dog he passed by the arbor, the twigs of which Daphnis had covered with lime, and seeing the bird-catcher, his spoils on his shoulder, about to set off home, he forgot his dinner and the dog. "'God bless thee, my son!' cried he, and fell upon Daphnis's shoulder, and after kissing him, he led him by the hand into the house." When the twain saw one another, they were overcome and nearly fell, but they kept steady on their legs, and with calm faces bade each other good day, kissed, and the embrace was propitious, for each supported the other, and a swoon was avoided. And Daphnis's hope being thereby exceeded, for he had not only seen but kissed Chloe, he sat down by the fire, and whilst throwing his great spoil of thrushes and pigeons on the table, he told the story to the company. How, bored and wearied by remaining within doors day after day, he had gone forth to catch birds. Some he had taken with springs and snares, and others with lime, as they fought with one another for the myrtle and ivy berries. He was praised by all for his wit, food was laid before him, and they bade him eat. And Chloe was told to pour out drink, which she did willingly for all, serving Daphnis the last, for she pretended anger against him for having come so near to her, and for having nearly left without having seen or spoken to her. All the same, before she poured out wine for him, she drank from the cup, and thirsty though he was, he drank slowly, so that he might lengthen out the pleasure. Not long after were gone all the bread and meat on the table, and the company, having taken their seats, fell to asking Daphnis for news of Myrtle and Lamon saying that it was a rare good fortune for them to have such a staff as he to support them in their old age. 
Daphnis was not sorry to hear himself praised, and the rather when he was praised in the presence of his Chloe. But when they told him that he must remain with them this day, and the day after, because on the morrow they were sacrificing to Bacchus, he felt very near to adoring them instead of the god. He emptied his wallet of many cakes and fell to plucking the birds he had caught for supper. Once more the fire was lighted, the wine was drawn, and the table spread. And as soon as the night had fallen, they began to eat, and after eating, they told stories and sang songs till sleep compelled them to their beds, Chloe with her mother, and Daphnis with Trias. But night brought her no more than thoughts of Daphnis, with whom she would spend the next day, and Daphnis deemed it a great good fortune to sleep even with the father of his Chloe, whom he embraced and kissed more than once, thinking in his dream that he was embracing and kissing Chloe. The morning was very cold, and a north wind came up with it that pierced and burned. When they were all assembled, Dryas sacrificed a yearling goat to Bacchus and lighted a great fire for the cooking of the dinner, and whilst Napi was baking the bread and Dryas was boiling the goat, Chloe and Daphnis were free to go into the arbor and set snares and traps and spread the twigs with bird lime, and whilst they were bird catching, they kissed each other continually, and between their kisses they spoke. Daphnis said, I came for thee, Chloe. I know that well enough, Daphnis. Because of thee, fair one, I killed these poor birds. What then am I to thee? Hast thou forgotten me? No, I have forgotten nothing. I swear it by the nymphs, whom we shall see again as soon as the snow is melted. Ah, Chloe, but the snow is deep. Mayhap I shall melt before it melts. Be not afraid, Daphnis, the sun will be warm, but let the spring come. Ah, would it were already like the fire that burns my heart, wicked one. Thou dost mock and cozen me, and one day thou wilt be unfaithful. No, never, by the goats on whom I swore before. In this manner Chloe answered her Daphnis like an echo, neither more nor less. Napi called them, and they ran, bringing with them their takings, more numerous than those of yesterday, and after having made libations to Bacchus, they fell to eating with crowns of ivy on their heads, and when they had eaten well, a hymn was sung to Bacchus, and Daphnis was sent forth with a wallet well filled with bread and mead, and they returned to him all the thrushes and stock doves to bring to Lamon and Myrtle, saying that they could take as many of these as they pleased, as long as winter lasted and the ivy had berries. So did Daphnis leave them, kissing all of them before he kissed Chloe, so that her kiss might remain in his memory distinct and pure. Other excuses were found to return to her, and so the winter was not empty of kisses and amorous pleasures for them both. And at the beginning of the spring the snow melted, the earth reappeared, the grass began to show, and the shepherds went forth again with their flocks to the fields, Chloe and Daphnis leading the way, they being servants of a greater shepherd. And running straight to the nymphs of the cave, then to Pan under the pine, and then to the oak, they sat watching their flocks grazing, kissing the while, and afterwards wandering in search of flowers to weave garlands for the gods. But in response to the sweet breath of Zephyrus, the flowers had only begun to awaken and to open to the heat of the sun, but they found violets and narcissus, lilies of the valley, and other flowers, firstlings of the new season and from these they wove chaplets, and whilst crowning the images they offered milk freshly drawn from their udders of their yews and she-goats. Then they began to play upon their pipes, as if to provoke a match with the nightingales, who answered them from the bushes, beginning little by little to lament Itis once again, and repeat their warble after a long silence. And then the yews began to bleed, and the lambs to skip and to kneel under the bellies of their mothers. The rams followed the yews that had not yet lambed, and having caught them, leapt, serving one after the other, and the bucks raced after the she-goats, jumping them in the same fashion and butting fiercely for love of them. Each had his own shees, and kept guard lest another should do him wrong. And so, by sight and sounds that would have enkindled the fires of Aphrodite in old men, the twain were afflicted, 
and compelled by their own nature to seek more eagerly than they had yet done that ease and content which kisses and embraces did not afford but daphnis the most for he being now lusty and well filled out having spent the whole winter within doors doing nothing thrilled after the kiss and was big as the phrase runs for embraces more curious in every one more hardy than he ever was before pressing chloe to grant him all he asked for and to lie with him flesh to flesh longer than was their custom for said he that is the one thing of philetus's counsels that remains untried the one and only medicine that soothes the pain of love chloe asked what else they could do but kiss and lie together as they were in their clothes and what he thought he might do if they were to lie together naked that which the rams do to the yews and the bags to the she-goats thou hast seen that after the jump the yo runs no longer from the ram they graze together assuaged and content so there is of a certainty a sweetness unknown to us a sweetness that surpasses the bitterness of love but has not seen said she that the rams and the yews and the bugs and the she-goats whilst tasting of the sweetness do not lie together but taste while standing up the rams leaping on the yews the yews receiving them on their backs yet thou wouldst have me lie on the ground with thee and naked are our beasts not clothed in wool and hair more closely than i am in these garments he believed her and lay beside her and for a long time he lay doing nothing for he was without knowledge how to do that which he desired ardently to do he lifted her up and endeavoured to imitate the goats but failing from behind as he had done in front he sat down beside her and began to weep for it was sad to find that he knew less about the ways of love than a tub not far away there was one who farmed his own land a man called chromis already past middle age somewhat broken and overworn he lived with a young woman dainty and blooming come from the town named lycanium who seeing daphnis pass every morning leading his flocks to pasture and returning with them in the evening to the fold was taken with a longing to have him for her lover and began to woo him with presents and to watch for him till one day catching him alone she gave him a flute some honeycombs and a wallet made of deerskin but she did not dare to open her mind to him for she divined his love for chloe he was always with her and she had seen them exchanging smiles and signs so one morning after telling chromis that she was going to see a neighbour in childbed she followed the twain step by step and from behind some bushes she saw all they did heard all they said and marking how daphnis wept was moved with sorrow for the twain and forthright began to look on the occasion as a double one for doing good to help them and to ease her own desire and this was her device on the morrow she spoke again to chromis of her friend who was still in labour but went to the oak under which were daphnis and chloe and feigning the troubled housewife alas my friend she said to daphnis i beg thee to come to my aid of my twenty goslings an eagle has taken the finest but since his burden was heavy the eagle was not able to carry it to the rocks above us where he has his eyrie and has fallen with it into this very wood and i implore thee daphnis by the nymphs and pan yonder to come with me i am frightened to go alone help me to get my gosling back and peradventure thou shalt kill the eagle that rapes away thy lambs and thy kids chloe can watch the two flocks a while thy she-goats know her as well as thee and daphnis suspecting nothing jumped up and crook in hand went away after lyconium who took him into the thickest part of the wood near to a spring-head and having asked him to sit down she said daphnis thou lovest chloe the nymphs came last night and told me of the tears thou didst weep yesterday and commanded me to free thee from thy trouble by teaching thee that love is more than kissing and embracing and more than all that the rams and the bugs can do it is something more and something sweeter and if thou wouldst be done with the worry that is upon thee and find the ease that thou art in search of 
thou hast only to apprentice thyself to me brave young lad and for love of the nymphs i will show thee what love is at this daphnis lost his head so glad was he poor village boy young and amorous and throwing himself on his knees before lyconium he joined his hands in prayer and begged of her to teach him at once the sweet craft of love so that he might have his desire with cloy and as if it were some great and marvellous secret he promised her a kid at the tit fresh cheeses cream and a she-goat with them and lyconium seeing him even more simple and natural than she had imagined began to instruct him and in this manner she ordered him to sit close to her and to kiss her as he and chloe were accustomed to kiss each other and whilst kissing her to embrace her and to lie on the ground beside her and as he was sitting by her kissing her and lying beside her she finding him ready raised him up slipped beneath him and put him in the way that he had long sought and then nature coming to his aid the natural was accomplished no more was done so finished the amorous lesson daphnis as innocent as before was running to chloe to teach her what he had learned as if he was afraid he should forget it but lyconium detained him thou must know daphnis that being a grown woman thou hast not hurt me for another man a long while back taught me what i have taught thee and for his pains he had my maidenhead but chloe when she will struggle with thee will cry out and will weep and will bleed as if she had been killed but do not be afraid and when she would give herself to thee bring her here so that if she cries out nobody will hear and if she weeps nobody will see and if she bleeds she can wash herself at the spring but never forget that it was i and not chloe that made thee a man after having given him this piece of counsel lyconium left him and crossed over the wood looking from side to side as if seeking her gosling and daphnis remained thinking of what she had told him eased of his earlier eagerness and uncertain whether he should trouble chloe with anything more than kisses and embraces he did not wish her to cry out for to do so would seem to him like the act of an enemy nor did he wish to make her weep for to do so would be a sign that he was hurting her nor did he wish to make her bleed for being a novice he dreaded blood and did not know that an issue of blood could be but from a wound so he returned from the wood resolved to take their usual pleasure and coming to where she sat weaving a chaplet of violets he told her a story of how he had saved lyconium's gosling from the talons of the eagle then taking her in his arms he kissed her as lyconium had kissed him during their enjoyment for that he thought could be done without danger chloe put upon his head the chaplet she had woven and at the same time kissed his hair which to her smelt sweeter than the violets and then gave him his wallet filled with dried raisins and some bread very often taking the bread and fruit from his mouth just as a little bird takes it from his mother's beak and whilst they ate together having less thought for food than for their kisses they spied a fishing boat passing by there was no wind and the sea was calm wherefore the oars were put out and the crew rowed with all diligence for they were bringing their fish to some rich man's house in mitylene and wished to show it fresh just come out of the sea and to beguile their weariness according to the custom of mariners one of them sang a sea-song the cadence of the song determining the beat of the oars the others like a choir uniting at intervals with the voice of the singer when they crossed an open stretch of the sea the sound was lost in space but when rounding a rocky point they entered a crescent-shaped bay the sound came loudly to the shore and the burden of the song was heard clearly for in the inmost part of the bay a rocky cloud caught the sound as if in an instrument and gave it back again with a voice of its own both the noise of the oars and the sailors chanting it was a delightsome hearing the voice from the sea ever coming the first and the land voice lingering so much the longer as it had begun later now daphnis who was accustomed to the mystery of echoes sat with his eyes fixed on the sea taking pleasure in watching the boat disappear into the distance like a bird into the air and sought to remember the song sufficiently to play it on his flute again 
but chloe never having heard the resonance of the voice that is called echo turned her head now seaward when the fishers sang and now towards the woods and valleys to see who it was that answered and when the fisher folk being gone all was silent on the sea and on land chloe asked daphnis if behind the rocky point there was another sea another boat and other rowers that sang he smiled sweetly and yet more sweetly he kissed her and putting on her head the wreath of violets began to tell her the story of echo asking her for the telling of it ten more kisses there are my darling many sorts of nymphs there are the nymphs of the woods and the nymphs of the fields and of waters all are beautiful and all are learned in the art of song and a daughter of one of them was called echo mortal for she was born of a mortal father and of a beauty befitting the daughter of a beautiful mother she was reared by the nymphs and taught by the muses who showed her how to play the pipe and the flute and to strike chords on the lyre and the cithern and all the art of song so when she came to womanhood she danced with the nymphs and sang with the muses but she fled from all males from gods as well as men loving better her virginity than all else for this pan was angry with her jealous because she sang so well and vexed for he was without hope of ever being allowed to enjoy her beauty so he sent a madness among the shepherds and the goat herds of the country and furious as wolves or mad dogs they threw themselves upon the poor girl tore her to pieces while she still sang casting hither and thither her broken but still songful limbs the earth for the nymph's sake kept her limbs preserved her song and ever since by the will of the muses repeats all voices and sounds just as the maiden did when alive men gods beasts instruments and pan himself she mocks when he plays on the pipe and when he hears her he follows her through the hills no longer from jealousy but curious to learn who is the hidden pupil whom he knows not and never can find but who repeats his music so beautifully and daphnis having ended his story chloe kissed him not only ten times as he had asked but many times more for echo repeated or very nearly all that he had said as if she wished to bear witness to the truth of his story the springtime had ended summer was commencing and the heat increased daily but with the season new pastimes daphne swam in the rivers chloe bathed in the springs he sought on his flute to imitate the music of the wind in the branches of the pines and she vied with the nightingales and together they hunted chicalas gathered grasshoppers plucked flowers shook the branches and ate the fruits that fell and lay under the same goatskin flesh to flesh then chloe might easily have been made a woman if daphnis had not been frightened at the thought of blood he had such great fear of it and was in such doubt that he might not always be master of himself that he did not suffer chloe to be naked often which caused her much surprise but she was afraid to ask him the reason for this forbiddance a first trouble but others followed quickly for during the summer a great press of lovers was about chloe come from all sides to ask her in marriage of dryas some brought presents and all made such great promises that Napi, stirred by greed began to talk of marrying her saying that so tall a girl should no longer remain at home and that if they did not hasten to give her a husband she would peradventure whilst watching her flocks in the fields lose her maidenhead and marry a shepherd for apples or roses Napi said it would be more to her advantage and theirs to make her the mistress of the house of some good man and to take what he offered to lay by for their own son for lately a little boy had been born to them and dryas was often swayed by the reason she gave for chloe's suitors offered more valuable presents than was usual to give her a simple shepherdess but dryas had always in mind that his daughter was born to a higher lot than a peasant's and one day might find her true parents and make everybody happy so the wars though they came laden with presents could get no direct answer from him but were put off from season to season and when the goings and comings of the suitors and all that was said of them came to chloe's knowledge and seeing the presents about the house she was greatly troubled but withheld the cause of her trouble from daphnis 
but he pressed her and importuned her so to tell him that she began to feel at last that by withholding the story she was causing him more suffering than if she told him everything so she told him all the number of the words and the presents they offered and the words that naby had used to bring over dryas and how at last he had come to think with her asking only that his answer might be remitted to the next vintage and on hearing these tidings daphnis was nigh bereft of his wit and sitting on the ground he wept saying he would die if chloe no longer came out to the fields to watch the flocks with him and not only he but the yaws and the she-goats would die of grief if they lost their shepherdess but when he had thought the matter over his courage began to return to him and he resolved to go to the father and declare himself one of her suitors in good hope that he would be far preferred to the others one thing however troubled him Layman was not rich his hopes fell but he was resolved no matter what might happen he would ask for chloe for wife and chloe was of the same mind all the same he did not dare to speak to Layman, but instead confided his love to myrtle boldly telling her he wished to wed chloe myrtle spoke to her husband that very night but Layman was by no means pleased at the thought of wedding daphnis to a shepherdess and he asked his wife if she had forgotten the marks and the signs on the clothing that the boy had been found wrapped in tokens and testimonies of his noble birth whereby he would be recognized one day or another by his parents who would not only give them their freedom but make them masters of larger and richer lands than those they held as serfs but myrtle thinking that the boy being in love might attempt his own life if he lost all hope of getting what he desired withheld from him Layman's reason for refusing his consent we are poor my lad she said and have need of a girl who will bring money to the house rather than take money out of it it is the other way about with her parents they are rich and would like to get a husband who will give and give again but go to chloe coax her and let her coax her father saying that he must not ask too much of us and to give her to thee in marriage without doubt she loves thee and would lie more willingly with thee than with any one of the rich wars as ugly as monkeys every one of them in this way she thought she had parried daphnis cleverly for she took it for granted that dryas with all the rich suitors as it were in the hollow of his hand would never give his consent and daphnis unable to find fault with her answer and seeing himself with little hope of getting chloe did what all poor lovers do on such occasions he began to weep and to call upon the nymphs to help him and they on the next night as he was asleep appeared to him in the same form and in the same manner as before the eldest among them said another god has charge of the marrying of chloe we will give thee gifts wherewith to bribe dryas the methymnean sheep whose hauser was eaten by thy goats a year ago was carried by the winds far from land but a storm coming from the sea in the night she was driven ashore on the rocks all that was in her was lost except a purse of money three hundred crowns which the waves cast up with some wreckage and it is now hidden in seaweed near to a dead dolphin unknown to anybody for everybody travelling that way ran from the stench and go thou and take the purse it is enough for thee now not to seem a beggar but in time to come thou shalt be rich as soon as these words were spoken the nymphs vanished with the night and dawn began daphnis rose very joyful and drove his flock to the fields with great whistling and having kissed chloe and saluted the nymphs he made to the shore as though he would refresh himself in the spray and on the sand close to the sea he walked looking for the three hundred crowns and he was not to have much trouble for presently the stench of the dead dolphin caught him in the nose and following it he came to a pile of seaweed in which he searched and found in it the well-filled purse which he put into his wallet not returning homeward till he had adored and thanked the nymphs and also the sea for shepherd though he was on that day the sea seemed to him tenderer and sweeter than the earth for it had helped him to win chloe for wife without delay then and deeming himself richer than the peasants of the neighbourhood richer than any living man he went to chloe to announce the dream he had had 
and after showing her the purse he had found, he asked her to watch his flock until his return. Then he swaggered off to Dryas, whom he found threshing wheat in the barn with his wife Maybe, and very boldly broke into the subject of the marriage. Give me Chloe to wife. I know how to play the flute, how to prune a vine, how to plant trees. I know how to plough the earth and to present the wheat to the farm. Chloe herself will bear witness that I know how to manage a flock. For a beginning I was given fifty she-goats, and in two years they have increased to a hundred. Moreover, I have furnished the flock with ten he-goats, tall, fine animals. Heretofore we led our she-goats elsewhere. I am young, and your neighbor, and nobody has a word to say against me. A she-goat suckled me, and Chloe was suckled by a yo. Being so much better than the others, I will not be behind them in gifts. All they can give are a few she-goats, a few sheep, a couple of mangy oxen, and hardly enough wheat to feed three chickens, whereas here are three hundred crowns for you. One thing, however, I ask, that nobody shall be told, not even my father layman. And saying these words, he gave Dryas the money, embraced and kissed him. And Dryas and Napy, seeing such a large sum of money, more than they had ever expected to see, promised him that he should have Chloe for a wife, and charged themselves to gain Lehman's consent. And leaving Daphnis and Napy to drive the oxen over the threshing floor, separating the wheat from the chaff, Dryas put by the purse in the place where the tokens were stored, and went off to Lehman and Myrtali to ask for their boy in marriage, therein reversing the usual custom. He found them measuring barley just taken from the fan, all the while complaining that it was with difficulty they gathered as much as they had sown. He comforted them, saying it was the same everywhere, and then asked them to give Daphnis as a husband to Chloe, saying that though the others had offered and given much for his consent, he did not want anything from them, but was ready to give a little of his own, for they were, he said, reared together, and whilst watching their flocks in the fields had fallen into such friendship that it would be a hardship to separate them now, and of all, they having now come to an age when they might very well lie together. He put forward all these reasons, and many others, with the favour of a man who had received three hundred crowns for his pleading. Layman could no longer excuse himself on the ground of poverty, for Dryas and Naby did not think themselves above him, nor could he plead Daphnis's age as an objection. The lad was near to manhood, and yet he would not utter the real truth, which was that Daphnis's parentage would not admit of such an alliance. But after having thought a little while, he said, Of good stock you must be indeed to prefer your neighbours to strangers, and to choose honest poverty rather than riches, and I pray that Pan and the nymphs shall recompense you. For myself, I desire this marriage as much as you do. I should be mad seeing myself fallen into years and needing help more than ever, if I did not look upon this alliance as a great piece of luck for me. Chloe, too, is much sought after, and is fair, and in her bloom, and good in every way. But being a serf, I can dispose of nothing. My master must be told, and his consent obtained. Come, then, let us postpone the wedding till the next autumn, for he will be here then. Such is the report in the town and will give his consent, I have no doubt of it, and till then they must love each other as brother and sister. But I should like to tell thee that the young man thou wouldst have for son-in-law is of better blood than we are. And that said, he kissed Dryas and poured out wine, for it was already undern, and went with him part of the road, treating him with all friendliness. But Dryas had not listened heedlessly to the words Lamon spoke before pouring out the wine, and returned home wondering who Daphnis might be. A she-goat was his nurse, and the gods have charge of him. He is beautiful, and in nothing is beholden to that flat-nosed old man and bald-pated old woman. He found when he needed them three hundred crowns, and it is hard to believe that a goat-herd could have put up so many nuts. Is he, like Chloe, a foundling? Did Lamon find him with marks and signs upon his waddles, just as I found them upon hers? O Pan and you nymphs, grant that it may be thus, 
and at the end of the adventure be that Daphnis will find his parents and something of Chloe's secret too. So did Dryas go his way deep in discourses and dreams till he came to his threshing floor, where he found the lad eager to hear what Laemon's answer might be. After bidding him be of good cheer, Dryas addressed him as his future son-in-law, promising him his wedding at the next vintage, giving him his hand in pledge that Chloe should belong to nobody but to him. And Daphnis, without waiting for food or drink, swifter than thought, ran to Chloe with the good news, and there and then kissed her, before everybody, as he had a right to do, she being his betrothed, and at once began to help her in her work. He milked the she-goats and yews into the pails, set the cheeses in baskets, put her lambkins under the udders, doing the same duty for his kids. And when all that was done, they washed themselves and ate and drank and went in search of the ripe fruits, of which there was great abundance, for it was after August, and the richness of September had brought ripe pears in plenty, medlars and azaroles, quinces falling from the branches, others hanging, waiting to be plucked, those on the ground having a sweeter scent, and those on the branches a ruddier bloom, the former smelling like wine, the latter shining like gold. Among the apple trees there was one whose fruit had all been gathered. Neither fruit nor leaves had it, only naked branches and one apple hanging from the highest branch, a marvellous apple, sweet-smelling, itself alone worth many for its fragrance. But he who had gathered the others had not dared to climb so high, or was careless to strike it down, an apple per adventure kept for an amorous shepherd. No sooner had Daphnis caught sight of this apple than he was set on climbing to gather it. Chloe said she would not have him gather it, but he paid no attention to her, wherefore, unlistened to and vexed, she left him, and Daphnis, climbing, reached the tree top and the apple which he gathered and brought to her. And seeing her face discontented, he spoke these words This apple, Chloe, my dear, was born of beautiful summer days. A fine tree nourished it, the sun ripened it, luck has kept it from the gatherer. I should have been blind indeed not to have seen it, and stupid having seen it to have left it on the bough, to fall later upon the ground to be crushed by the feet of the cattle, or poisoned by a serpent as he went by, or to hang on high, desired, admired, be praised, to be spoiled at last by time. Aphrodite won an apple as the prize of her beauty, and an apple I award thee. The judges, too, of her and thee are alike. He was a shepherd, I am a goat herd. Saying these words, he laid the apple on Chloe's lap, and she, when he bent over her, kissed him so sweetly that Daphnis did not regret having climbed so high for a kiss that to him was worth more than a golden apple. End of section 3《Section Section Four of the Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bonita Dominguez. The Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe by Longus, translated by George Moore. Book the Fourth. It fell out, however, for one of the lord's retainers to come from the town, with the news that the master would arrive before the vintage to view the damage that the Methamnians had done to his fields. And the season being advanced and the great heats over, Lamont had no time to lose, and was busy every day in the house and the gardens, anxious that the master's eye should fall upon nothing that was displeasing to him. He scoured the fountains so that the water should be pure and clear, and the manure heap in the courtyard was carried away lest a bad smell should reach the master's nostrils, and the orchard he tidied so that the master might find it more beautiful than he had expected. A beautiful and pleasing place this orchard was, one worthy of a king's inheritance, half a quarter of a league in length, on high ground, five hundred paces wide, wherefore almost as broad as it was long. Now in this orchard were all kinds and sorts of trees, the apple, the pear, the myrtle, the pomegranate, the fig, and the olive, 
and a high-growing vine that trailed over the apple and pear trees, seeming to vie with them in fruitage as it ripened. All these were of man's cultivation, but there were also forest trees that bore no fruit and planted themselves, such as the laurel, the plane, the cypress, the pine, and over their branches ivy trailed with bunches of berries already black, imitating the grape. The fruit trees were in the center of the orchard, where they might be safer, and those that bore no fruit were on the fringes, a sort of rampart, all close like a hedge, a sort of little unmortared wall. There was order and excellent distribution, sufficient spacing being allowed between the trunks of the trees for them to increase and to develop, their branches, however, meeting and interweaving overhead so beautifully that nature seemed like art. Also there were beds and borders of flowers, natural flowers of nature's own sowing, and flowers, too, that man had sown, the roses, the hyacinths, and the lilies were man's gifts to the garden. The violets, the narcissi, and the daisies were nature's. There were flowers in the spring, shadows in summertime, fruits in autumn, pleasure and content all the year round. Every opening in the trees discovered the great plain below, with shepherds keeping watch over their flocks, and thence were to be seen the ships on the sea, coming and going along the coasts, a continual pleasure added to the other pleasances of this place. In the middle of the orchard, at the meeting of two paths that cut it a lawn and across, there was a temple dedicated to Bacchus, the altar clothed with ivy, the temple overrun by a vine and within the temple was the story of Bacchus painted, Semele giving birth, Ariadne asleep, Lycurgus bound, Pentheus torn, Indians overcome, Tyrrhenians changed into dolphins, and satyrs gaily vintaging and treading the grapes, and everywhere Bacchantes leading the dances forward. Pan was not forgotten, but was shown seated on a rock plain, it would seem, a music for the common prophet of the Bacchantes that danced, and the satyrs treading in the wine-presses. In this orchard of mixed art and nature, Lamont was busy pruning and cutting the dry and dead branches, and raising and rehaining the fallen vines he crowned bacchus daily with new wreaths and devised a rill whereby he brought water from a fountain for daphnis had found a spring-head now called daphnis's fountain and the flowers were sprinkled with the water from it lamont had a word to say to daphnis about his goats he would do well to fatten them as speedily as possible for the master not having seen his flocks and herds for a long time would inspect them carefully but Daphnis had no doubt that he would get praise for his flock, for he had doubled the number of the she-goats that had been given to him. Not one of them had been ravened away by a wolf, and they were all in prime condition, fat as sheep. All the same, to raise himself in the master's esteem, and to make sure of his consent to the marriage, he gave all his time and care to the flock, striving hard for further improvement of it leading it to the fields in the early morning and returning in the dusk twice a day he watered the flock and his eyes were always open for the best pasturage he remembered to get new bowls a stock of milking pails and a great number of cheese racks nor did his diligence stop at this he oiled his goat's horns cleansed and combed their shag till whosoever saw the flock would take it for one sacred and dedicated to pan chloe labored with him neglecting her yoes and daphnis thought that it was her doing that his flock appeared so fine whilst they were thus busy another messenger came from the city with an order that the vintage was to begin at once and that he was to remain in charge till the wine was made and then to return to the town for his master who would not arrive until the last fruits were gathered at the end of autumn the messenger's name was eudromus which signifies a runner and his business was to run wherever he was sent he was well received with good cheer, and the vintage was begun, and so heartily that within a few days the grapes were gathered, 
pressed and the wine drawn off into jars a number of the finest bunches however being left on the branches so that those who came from the town could form an idea of the pleasure of the vintage and think they had been there when eudromus was ready to leave daphnis bethought himself of what presents he could give him and he gave what a goatherd could give some beautiful cheeses a kid and the skin of a she-goat whose shag was long wherewith he might cover himself in winter whilst travelling and he was glad of it kissed daphnis and promised to give a good account of him to their master and thus it was he returned to the town well disposed to them all daphnis remaining in the fields with chloe both in great trouble of mind her trouble not less than his for she remembered his youth and that he had seen nothing except his goats the hills peasants and herself and very soon he was going to see his master whose name he had barely heard till now she was anxious to know how he would speak to his master and was alarmed about their marriage fearing that it would disappear like a dream or a whiff of smoke and so troubled by thoughts were they that their kisses were henceforth mixed with fears and their embraces almost mournful and in dread they lay in each other's arms as if the master was already there and could see them and as if these troubles were not enough another fell upon them not far away was a neat herd named lampus a crafty dangerous fellow who had thought that he might get chloe for wife and for that end made dryas many presents but now getting wind of daphnis's suit and fearing that he would get her if the master were satisfied with him he began to seek for means whereby he might provoke the master against him in Lamont, and knowing that the master set great store in his gardens he thought how these might be ruined and spoilt if he set to work to fell the trees he would be seen and heard so he thought that it would be better for him to make havoc among the flowers which could be done easily at night and passing in one night by the little door in the wall he tore and trampled them under foot just like a wild boar would and then withdrew nobody having seen him when lamond the next day on going into the garden as was his custom to water his flowers saw the place laid waste as if by an enemy in open warfare or a robber he tore his jacket crying o oh, gods so loudly that mertail leaving her work ran to him and daphnis leaving his goats to themselves returned to the house and seeing the great damage done they cried aloud and wept and though vain indeed it was to grieve for the flowers they dreaded their lord's anger it was not wonderful that these people should weep even a stranger who would never see the garden again would have been moved by the sight of flower-beds and borders dug up and all the flowers thrown along the walks here and there a bloom had so far escaped outrage that it still shone as it lay fair and resplendent and these were still beset by the bees murmuring continually like mourners and lamont with gestures of despair spoke these words oh my rosaries are broken down and torn my violet beds are trodden into the ground my narcissi and hyacinths are torn up a bad and wicked man it must be who has served me in this wise the springtime will return but these will not flower again the summer will come and the garden be without a bloom the autumn is nigh and there are not enough flowers to tie into a posy thou bacchus hadst thou no pity for these poor flowers that have been in thy presence before thine eyes ruined this wicked man has robbed thee of many crowns how will i dare to show my master his garden what will he say to me when he sees all this wreckage will he not hang his old servant like a second marsyas to one of those pines and will he not perchance hang daphnis too thinking that his goats have done this mischief thinking he had watched them ill these words tears ran down their eyes again the flowers were forgotten they wept for themselves chloe wept for poor daphnis who might be hanged from the pine tree and prayed to the gods the master waited for so long should not come and her days passed wearily in thoughts that she already saw her daphnis stripped for scourging 
eudromus returned the same evening bringing the word that they might expect the old master three days hence but that his son would arrive on the morrow and they fell to talking asking each other how they might tell the story of the ruined garden calling into their counsel eudromus who being well disposed to daphnis said that the young master should be told how the mischief had happened and he promised he would do all he could to help them and he could do much for the young master had consideration for him he being his foster brother and on the morrow they did all that he had told them a stylus arrived on horseback bringing with him also on horseback a friend to keep him company a seeming time server some years older than a stylus as might be judged from their beards for a stylus had no more than a little down on the chin whereas gnatho's chin had known the razor for some years and the young man had barely dismounted when lamon taking Mertail and daphnis with him threw himself at his feet and begged of him to have pity upon a poor old man and save him from the anger of his father and the rather as it was through no fault of his that the mischief had been done a stylus pitied them and on entering the garden and seeing how it had been wrecked he promised to take it all upon himself and say that it was his horses that had broken their tethers and trampled with their hooves on the beautiful flowers lamon's pride and care and for this kindly promise lamon and Mertail prayed that the gods might grant him the fulfilment of all his desires and daphnis brought him some choice presents such as young goats cheeses and nests of birds with the nestlings in them vine shoots with bunches of grapes upon them and branches of apple trees red with fruit and daphnis also gave him fragrant lesbian wine the most enjoyable of all a stylus thanked him and seemed glad to receive the gifts and whilst waiting for his father found pleasure in hunting the hare as befits a young man of good family and fortune who has come to take the air of the fields but gnatho was a guttler who ate and drank to repletion and after drinking appeased his lusts in a word he was all gullet and belly and what is beneath the belly and when daphnis came with his presence gnatho was struck by his beauty and certain that the town could show nothing that would compare with him fell to thinking how he might make his acquaintance for it did not occur to him that he might fail to get his way with a young goatherd such as he and that his desires might be fulfilled he found reasons not to go hunting with the stylus and wandered instead to the place where daphnis was watching his beasties saying that he had come to look at the flock and to get his way more easily with daphnis he began his courtship by praising the she-goats begging him to play upon his flute some shepherd's song and promising him that very soon he would use his influence which was great with the master to procure his freedom and believing that his promises and flatteries had brought the goat-herd to his will he lay in wait for him in the evening when he was bringing home his flock to the fold and running to him he kissed him first and then told him that he wished to receive from him the kindness that the she-goat afforded to the buck for a long time daphnis did not understand what he meant and at the last answered him that it was natural that the buck should jump upon the she-goat but that he had never seen a buck jump upon another buck nor did the rams mount one upon the other instead of upon the yos nor did the cocks tread each other instead of the hens all the same gnatho laid his hand upon him as if he would take him by force but daphnis pushed him back roughly and as he was drunk and could barely stand on his feet threw him on his back and ran away like a young hare leaving to some passer-by the business of picking him up and henceforth daphnis kept out of his way leading his she-goats to graze first in one place and then in another avoiding him sedulously and keeping an eye on chloe and gnatho having discovered that daphnis was not only beautiful but had a will of his own and could enforce it ceased to importune him and sought instead a stylus who he believed could refuse him nothing and might be persuaded to give him daphnis he could not however find the occasion he needed 
for Dionysophanes and his wife Clarista arrived, and there was in the house and about it a great pother of horses, valets, men, and women, and whilst waiting to get a stylus alone, he prepared for his ear a long speech about his passion. Dionysophanes was turning grey, but he was tall and so well built that he could hold his own with many a younger man, one of the richest of the citizens of his town, and with as kind a heart as any. He sacrificed the first day of his arrival to the gods of the fields and woods, to Ceres, Bacchus, and Pan, and the nymphs, and called his family together for the feast. On the following days he visited Lamont's farm, and seen everywhere good tilth, vines well pruned, and the orchard as beautiful as before, for Silas had taken all the blame for the flowers. He was pleased to find everything in such good order, praised Lamont for his diligence and promised him his freedom, and that done, he bethought himself of his flocks and the goat herd that watched them chloe ran away and hid herself in the woods frightened by the coming of such a grand company daphnis remained and waited for his master his loins covered with a goatskin of long shag a new wallet slung over his shoulders holding in one hand a cheese freshly made and with the other leading some suckling kids if apollo had ever been neat heard to laomedon he must have appeared like daphnis when he stood silently his face red with blushes and his eyes downcast before the master offering him his gifts and then lamon speaking for him said this is daphnis master thy goat herd out of the fifty she-goats and the two bucks that thou gavest me he has made a hundred she-goats and ten bucks See how fat they are, with long, shaggy hair, and not a broken horn among them, and well instructed, too, in music, and obedient to it, doing all he wishes at the sound of his flute. Clarista, being present, said that she would like to see these things done, and Daphnis was told to play his flute as he was accustomed to do when he wished to direct his flock and he was promised if he succeeded a new jacket shirt and shoes then daphnis standing under an oak and with all the company about him took his flute from his wallet and blew softly into it immediately the she-goats stopped all raising their heads then he blew for them to graze and immediately they dropped their muzzles and browsed then he played a sweet low tune and at once they were all lying on the ground another set of notes clear and sharp and they fled into the wood as if at the approach of a wolf and then at the note of recall they returned from the wood and lay down about his feet never did a master have serfs more obedient to his orders than these she's were to the sound of the flute at which the company wondered and of all clarista who said that she would give what she had promised to the gentle goat-herd who was so handsome and played his flute so well after that they repaired to the house and supped, and they sent out to Daphnis some share of the food, which he received and ate with Chloe joyfully, curious to eat food cooked according to town fashion, and having now good hope that he would be able to obtain his master's consent to his marriage. But the sight of Daphnis with his flute had inflamed Gnatho, and thinking that without Daphnis his life was not life at all, he took advantage of a moment when a stylus was walking alone in the garden to take him to the temple of bacchus and there to kiss his hands and his feet and a stylus asking why he did this and what he wished to say your poor gnatho is undone master said he for i who till now was in love only with a table loaded with good cheer and to whom nothing was so desirable as a jar of old wine and who said that all of the use of middling were not to be compared with thy cooks find nothing in this world amiable or beautiful but daphnis yes i would like to be one of his she-goats and would leave all that is served at thy table meat fish preserved fruits if i might eat grass to the sound of his flute and under his crook brows on leaves 
but do thou my master save the life of thy notho and vanquish unvanquishable love else i swear by thee who art my god that after having filled my belly i will take my knife and go to daphnis's threshold and there i shall kill myself and then thou'lt have no one to whom thou canst say my good little notho the young man was of such kindly heart, himself being acquainted with love's pain, that he could not bear to see Notha weep and kiss his feet and hands again. So he promised that he would ask Daphnis of his father, that he might bring him as a servant to the town, and that Notha should have his will of him. Then for comfort he asked him, laughing, if he was not ashamed to kiss the little shepherd, Lamont's son, and mocked at the pleasure he would get in line with the goat herd, saying which he snipped as if he had suddenly got wind of the buck. But Notho, who had learnt at the tables of rich profligates all that could be said or told about love, and thought that he could justify his passion, answered with some good sense, He who loves, so my dear master, does not think of all that there is nothing in this world if it have beauty that may not inflame us some have loved a plant some a river others a wild beast and what sadder condition of love is there than to fear what one loves for myself what i love is a serf by fate but ennobled by his beauty does not his hair resemble a hyacinth flower and under his eyebrows his eyes brighten like burnished stones who can be insensible to his damask cheek to that red mouth furnished with teeth white as ivory who is so insensible such an enemy of love as not to desire all this i gave my love to a shepherd and in doing so do i not find exemplars among the gods and Chises, a neat herd was sought by aphrodite in his fields branches led she-goats to feed and apollo loved him Ganymedes was a shepherd, and the lord of all things raped him away for his pleasure. Let us not despise a child to whom the beasts themselves are obedient. Rather should we be thankful to the eagles of Jupiter that allow such beauty to remain still upon the earth. At these words the stylist began to laugh, saying what great sophisters love makes, and henceforth he was on the watch for an occasion to speak of this matter to his father. But Eudromus, having overheard a great part of the plan, and detesting that so fair a young fellow as Daphnis should be given over to the pleasure of this drunkard, and being well inclined towards him himself, wishing him all good fortune, went at once and told the story to both Daphnis and Lamon. And shocked, overwhelmed, Daphnis came to a sudden resolution, to fly with Chloe or to die with her. But Lamont called Mertail from the yard. "'We are lost, wife,' said he. "'Now has come the time to reveal the secret. "'Come what may, though we lose our herds and the rest, "'and I remain like an ox in the stall, doing nothing, as the saying is. "'I swear by the nymphs and by Pan that I will keep silence no longer, "'but tell Daphnis's story, will declare how I found him, "'will say how I reared him, will show what I found with him.' I will do all this so that this gangrel rogue will know what he is, and to whom he is paying his addresses. Go and fetch the signs and tokens. And that said, they entered the house. But a stylus coming upon his father auspiciously, asked that Daphnis should return with them to Middling, saying that it was a pity so pleasing a lad should be left in the fields, and one who would soon learn the ways of the town from Notho. The father gave his consent at once, and calling for Lamont and Mertail, he told them the good news that Daphnis, instead of herding the goats, would for the future wait on his son Astylus in the town. To replace him he promised two other shepherds, and his decision becoming known, the other slaves ran to one another with the tidings, esteeming Daphnis a pleasant addition to their company. Lamont thereupon asked permission to speak and he spoke in this manner my master i beg of thee to listen to me a poor old man i swear by the nymphs and god pan that every word i speak is the truth i am not daphnis's father nor was the happiness of carrying such a boy granted to my wife he was exposed in the first months of his life by his parents who may have had enough of older children 
but i found him abandoned by his father and mother suckled by a she-goat who for her mother mercy died a natural death and was buried by me in a corner of my garden i found tokens that were left with him so that he might be afterwards recognized i confess them to thee and i keep them to this day for they are signs that he came of a much higher rank than we are i am not sorry that he should serve thy son of stylus and be to a handsome and good lord a handsome and good servant but i cannot abide that gnatho should take him to middling and make a wench of him lamont stopped speaking like one suddenly struck dumb he began to weep and gnatho enraged would have beaten him if dionysophanes stern face had not bade him forbear Dionysophanes commanded a silence, and after thinking for a while he questioned the old man anew, enjoining him to tell the truth, and not to invent tales in the hope that his son might be left with him. But Lamont persisted that all he had said was but the truth, calling on the gods, and offering to submit himself to torture if he lied. Dionysophanes turned to Clarista, sitting beside him, and they examined the story they had heard together. For what purpose or what end should Lamont have invented it? Had he not been promised two goat herds for the one that was to be taken from him? How indeed could a rough peasant have invented such a story? Moreover, was it not plain that so handsome a lad could not have been born of such humble folk? So did they think and argue, till suddenly it seemed to them that they were wasting time in vain conjectures and guessing, and that what they should do was to view the signs and tokens which would tell if Lamont's story was a true one, and if Daphnis came of a higher rank than his foster parents. Mertail went away and came back with the old sack in which they had been kept. The first to see them was Dionysophanes, and when he saw the purple mantle with the clasp of gold and the knife with the ivory handle, he cried out, O oh Lord Zeus, and called his wife that she might see these things. And when she saw them, she cried out, O oh, ye goddesses of fate, are not these the very things that we put with our child when we sent him to be exposed by our maidservant Sophrony? There is no doubt that these are the tokens that were left with him. My husband, the child is ours. Daphnis is thy son, and goatherd of his father's she-goats. Dionysophanes shed tears of joy whilst his wife spoke, and kissed the tokens and signs of recognition. A stylus having heard that Daphnis was his brother, dropped his robe and ran through the garden to be the first to kiss him. Daphnis seen him running towards him with many others, and hearing him cry, Daphnis! Daphnis! thought that this was to take him prisoner, threw away his flute in his wallet, and fled towards the sea to throw himself from the top of the rock. Daphnis, by some strange accident, might have been no sooner found than lost, if a stylus, guessing the reason of his flight, had not cried out from afar, Stop, Daphnis, have no fear, I am thy brother. Thy masters are thy parents. Lamont has told us all and shown us everything. Stop, look, how they come laughing. Kiss me the first. By the nymphs I speak the truth. On hearing the oath, Daphnis stopped and waited for a stylus, who ran to him with open arms, and the two embraced. Then everybody in the house, men servants, maid servants, father and mother, came in turn to embrace and to kiss rejoicing and weeping daphnis welcomed them all but his first welcome was given to his father and mother and it would have seemed that he had always known them so warmly did he take them to his bosom hardly could he tear himself away from their arms so quickly doth nature establish trust for a moment even chloe was forgotten by him he was taken to the house and given beautiful and costly garments, and when these were donned he sat beside his father, who spoke these words. My children, I married when I was very young, and in no long time I had become, as I thought, a happy father, for the first child born to me was a son, the second a girl, and the third a stylus. 
I thought that three would ensure the continuance of my lineage, and this one coming after the others was exposed in a swaddles with rings and gems, looked on by me as funeral ornaments rather than tokens designed to make him known to us one day. But fortune counseled otherwise, for my eldest son and my daughter died of the same evil on the same day, and thou, Daphnis, by the providence of the gods hast been preserved to help us through our old age. All the same, thou must not hate me, my child, for having exposed thee according to the wishes of the gods. And thou, Astylus, regret not that thou shalt have to share thy heritage with thy brother, for there are no riches in this world worth a good brother. Love each other, my children, and in respect of worldly goods vie with kings, for I will leave you large lands and well-trained servants, gold and silver, and whatsoever belongs to those that prosper. Only this land I single out as a gift to Daphnis, and with it Lamon and Myrtae on the goats that he has herded. He was still speaking when Daphnis started to his feet suddenly. Thy words have called something to my mind, father. I must go and water my goats. They must be thirsty by now, awaiting the sound of my flute before drinking, and I sit in here doing nothing. At this everybody began to laugh. Although now a master, Daphnis would still be a goat herd. Another was sent to do this service to the goats, and they sacrificed to Jupiter, the Saviour, and a command was issued for a great feast. Notho alone did not dare to appear, for fear of Daphnis he had hidden himself all the day and the night in the temple of Bacchus as a suppliant and the news immediately was carried hither and thither that Dionysophanes had found a son, and that Daphnis the goatherd was found to be the lord of the fields. And with the dawn the neighboring peasantry ran from all sides to rejoice with the young man and to make presents to his father. Among these Dryas was one of the first, Chloe's foster-father. Dionysophanes would not have it otherwise, but that all should remain for the feast, having prepared a great store of bread, of wine, of game of all sorts, honey cakes in plenty, suckling pigs, and victims many were sacrificed to the protecting deities of the country. Then Daphnis gathered up all the tools of his trade, and these he presented to the gods. His wallet and his goatskin were given to Bacchus, pan got his shepherd's pipe and his cross flute his crook was presented to the nymphs with the milking pails made by his own hands but first customs and practices are sweeter than a new fortune and he could not yield these tokens of his past life without weeping many tears he did not hang up the milking pails before milking the she-goats and he did not give his pipe to pan till he had played upon it once more nor did he surrender his goatskin to Bacchus till he had donned it a last time, and before giving he kissed every one of these. He had then to bid his goats good-bye. He called the bucks one after another by their names. He drank once more from the spring-head where many times he had drunk with Chloe, but he did not yet dare to speak of their loves, still watching for his occasion. And whilst he knelt unmindful of all but his offerings and sacrifices, chloe sat alone in the fields watching her sheep poor forlorn girl saying daphnis has forgotten me he is thinking now of some rich marriage why did i not make him swear by the nymphs instead of by his goats he has forgotten them too even while sacrificing to the nymphs and to pan he has no thought to seek chloe he may have found in his mother's house a servant more beautiful than i am good-bye daphnis be happy, but there is no life for me. She was still immersed in these sad dreams when the neat herd Lampus, helped by some other peasants, came to carry her off in the belief that Daphnis would think no more of marrying her, and that once she had fallen into his hands, Dryas would give his consent that she should remain with him. As he carried her away, the poor forlorn girl cried loudly for help, and one witness of this violent deed ran to nape who told dryas and dryas ran to daphnis but he though distraught by the tidings did not dare to ask help from his father and unable to endure his pain went to the edge of the garden and broke in lamentation oh unhappy that i am in having discovered my parents 
how much better it would have been for me to have watched always my beasties in the fields how much happier was i when i was a serf with chloe then i saw her then i kissed her and now lampus has ravished her away and when the night comes he will lie with her whilst i am eating and drinking delighting in good cheer in vain did i swear by my goats and by god pan now while daphnis uttered these complaints gnotho lurking in the garden was listening and believing this to be a good occasion to make his peace with daphnis he called together some of astylus's servants and went after dryas telling him that he must direct them to lampus's cottage and made all speed thither and arriving in the nick they surprised lampus as he was dragging chloe over his threshold whom they plucked from his arms and after beating with their sticks the shoulders of the rustics who had helped him in the rape they looked round for lampus thinking to take him prisoner but he had escaped in the confusion a veritable triumph this was for gnotho who returned to the house when it was dark bringing chloe with him Dionysophanes was in bed asleep, but Daphnis walked weeping in the orchard, deploring his fate. And after giving each to the other, Gnotho told him all he had done, praying Daphnis to forget the past, to keep him for a diligent servant, and not to drive him from his table, to die of hunger by the wayside. The sight of Chloe, the having Chloe in his arms, made it easy for Daphnis to come to terms with him, and having agreed to all he asked, he begged forgiveness of Chloe for his seeming neglect of her. And it not being a time for reproaches, they at once fell to thinking what their conduct should be, both coming quickly to the same mind, that their intended wedding should not be made known yet a while, but that he should continue to see her in secret, confessing his love of her to nobody but his mother. But Dryas was stubborn, and would not have it otherwise than that Daphnis's father should be told, and took it upon himself to persuade Dionysophanes to give his consent. On the morrow at daybreak he brought the signs and tokens that he had found with Chloe to Dionysophanes, whom he came upon in the orchard sitting with Clarista and their two children, Astylus and Daphnis, and this is what he said. The same knee that obliged Lamont to confess his secret is upon me to-day. A like secret is mine to his, that I did not beget nor rear Chloe another begot her and a yo suckled her in the cave of the nymphs this i saw and marvelled and since then i have brought her up her beauty testifies that she is not of our blood as much as the signs and tokens that i found with her richer than any poor shepherd could afford look at them and then search for her parents for by some hap her kin may be one not unsortable with thine own master Dryas's words were cunningly planned, and they did not fall on unheeding ears. Dionysophanes, having Daphnis under his eyes, and seeing him change color and turn aside to weep, knew at once that there must have been love passages between these twain. And being more mindful of his son than of somebody else's daughter, he considered carefully the story that Dryas had told and when he had examined the signs and tokens that had been found with her the gilt shoes the embroidered hosiery and the golden headdress he called her to him and bade her be of such good cheer as was becoming to one who had found herself a husband and would very soon find her father and mother she was put in clarista's care who gave her such clothes and jewelry as befitted daphnis's future wife but Dionysophanes, taking Daphnis aside, asked him if she was still a maiden. Daphnis swore that they had only kissed and embraced, and vowed always to belong one to the other, at which Dionysophanes was delighted, and laughing at the story of their rural oaths, he bade them to a banquet. And at this banquet could be seen how much nature can gain from art, for Chloe, gowned and with her hair caught up, appeared so much more beautiful in the present than she had ever been in the past that even daphnis hardly recognized her and whosoever saw her in her array would have unhesitatingly affirmed upon oath that she was not dryas's daughter he was there at the feast with nape lamon and myrtale all four couched together 
on the days that followed they sacrificed anew to the gods on chloe's behalf as they had done for daphnis setting up bowls of wine and as daphnis had done she gave all the tools of her trade to the gods her wallet her flute the skin she had worn the pails into which she milked her yoes and poured wine into the spring-head in the cave of the nymphs for it was there she was found and suckled she scattered chaplets and posies of flowers in the tomb of the yo her foster-mother which dryas showed her piped a farewell to her flocks and prayed to the nymphs that her natural parents should not be of such sort as would misbecome her alliance with daphnis when they had had enough of feasts and junketings in the fields they bethought themselves of her return to middling with a view to seeking out chloe's parents so that the wedding need not be delayed any longer wherefore next morning they were busy betimes packing and parceling their goods and chattels bidding dryas good-bye and bestowing upon him another three hundred crowns and upon lamon the half part of the land to sow and gather its harvest and the she-goats with their goat-herds four yoke of oxen furred cloaks for winter wear and freedom for his wife mortail and these things done they took the road to middling in a great pother of horses and wagons as they did not arrive home till late at night the citizens of the town knew nothing of what had fallen out but on the morrow there was a great throng about dionysophanes's house of men and women the men to rejoice with the father that he had found his son their rejoicings redoubled when they saw what a handsome courtly lad he was and the women to rejoice with clarista not only upon the recovery of her son but also of a girl worthy of being his wife for chloe astonished them all so perfect was her beauty that it was not easy to imagine any one more beautiful briefly the town spoke of nothing else but the young man of the young girl saying that it was impossible to find a more beautiful pair many prayers were offered up to the gods that the parentage of the girl might be found worthy of her beauty and many rich Middleian matrons prayed the gods that chloe might be reputed their daughter but dionysophanes after having pondered long and arduously on this matter retired to his bed and a vision came in the heavy sleep that fell upon him in the morning he saw the nymphs in the vision begging eros to bring about the fulfilment of the wedding making good his promise whereupon eros slackened the string of his bow and placing it beside his quiver ordered dionysophanes to invite the chief citizens of middling to a feast at his house and that when the last goblet was filled the signs and tokens of recognition found with chloe should be shown to each of the guests in turn and that done that they should sing together the epithalamium and having had this vision in his sleep dionysophanes rose betimes and ordered his people to prepare a great festival at which all the delicate meats of the earth and the sea and the rivers and the marshes afford should be served and when the night came all the chief citizens of middling were his guests and when the last goblet was filled for libations to hermes a servant of the house brought in a silver basin the signs and tokens and these were shown in turn to the guests according to their rank but none recognized these save one named megacles who because of his age was placed at the end of the table and as soon as he saw them he remembered them and cried very loudly o oh gods what do i see here my poor daughter what has become of thee art thou alive or did some shepherd steal these tokens that it was his luck to find in the fields i beg of thee dionysophanes to tell me whence thou hast these tokens of my child and do not grudge me that after thy finding of daphnis i too should find somewhat dionysophanes wished first of all that he should tell the company how he had exposed his child wherefore megacles still speaking with a loud voice said a long time ago i found myself without any means having spent all i had on plays and shows and on building galleys and manning them and whilst wasting my fortune on these things a daughter was born to me and being unwilling to rear her in the poverty from which it then seemed i could not escape 
i exposed her with signs and tokens whereby she might be recognized knowing that many desire even in this way to become parents the child was carried to the cave of the nymphs and left under their guardianship and protection afterwards i grew rich again from every side money came but an heir to whom i might leave my wealth was denied to me i was not even fortunate enough to beget a daughter and the gods as if knowing my desire and to mock me often sent me dreams that promised that a yo should make me a father at these words dionysophanes cried even louder than megacles had done and rising from the table he went to find chloe whom he brought back dressed richly yet modestly and leading her to megacles so that he might take her hands he said here is the child that thou didst expose megacles a yoe by the providence of the gods suckled her for thee just as a she-goat nourished my daphnis take her with these tokens and after taking her give her in wedding to daphnis we both abandoned our children and we have both refound them they have been reared together guarded by the nymphs by pan and by eros megacles was of the same mind and when his wife rhoda whom he sent for came she found her daughter in her father's arms then they slept remaining where they were for daphnis vowed he would not let chloe go not even to her father and in the morning the twain begged their fathers and mothers to allow them to return to the fields for they were still ill at ease in the town and it was resolved to celebrate their wedding in the manner of shepherds so they returned to lamon's cottage and introduced to megacles the foster parent of chloe dryas and his wife nape was presented to rhoda and now all of them being in accord preparations were begun for the nuptial festival megacles once more consigned his daughter chloe to the guardianship of the nymphs and among the many offerings that he made to the nymphs were the signs and tokens whereby his daughter had been brought back to him and to dryas he gave what was wanting to make his three hundred crowns ten thousand the days being still fine and beautiful dionysophanes ordered a plentiful feast to be laid in the cave of the nymphs with couches of green boughs and upon these all the peasants of the neighbourhood took their places lamon and Merteo were there dryas and nape dorkin's kindred and friends philetus with his sons chromus and lycoenium even lampus was present being forgiven and all that was said and done was according to village life and customs one sang a reaping song and all the jests and scorns and whimsies of the wine presses were heard again philetus played his pipes and lampus his flute daphnis and chloe kissing each other meanwhile the she-goats too wandered in and snatched at the green branches much to the dislike of the guests that had come from the town and daphnis called them all by their names tempting them with green branches taking them by their horns and kissing them not that day only but the best part of their lives they passed as shepherds acquiring large herds of she-goats and yoes remaining always staunch in their reverence for the nymphs and for god pan and for eros always averse from meat their choice going to fruit and milk and moreover they gave their first child a son to be suckled by a she-goat and to the second that was a girl was given the tit of a yo and these were named philopemon and agileia and so they lived in the fields for long years and in great content the cave of the nymphs was tidied with devotional hands and it was adorned with images and an altar was raised there to eros the shepherd and so that pan might no longer remain uncovered under the pine they built a temple in his honour calling it the temple of pan the warrior all that was long afterwards but now the night having come the guests accompanied them to their nuptial chamber some playing the flute others the pipes others with lanterns and torches in their hands walked in front of them and when they were on the threshold of the chamber a nuptial hymn was begun in tones harsh and rude as the sounds of pickaxe and mattock 
Meanwhile, Daphnis and Chloe lay naked in bed, where they exchanged kisses and embraces without closing an eye all the night. Wakeful as the night jars, Daphnis practicing with Chloe all that Lycoinium had taught him, and Chloe coming to understand that all they had done hitherto in the woods was but the play of children. End of Book the Fourth End of the Pastoral Loves of Daphnis and Chloe by Longus, translated by George Moore.